Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Thursday Truth Lectures, final day. We're looking forward to uh, the lectures that will be presented uh, both this morning and then also tonight. I uh, appreciate you all coming out again as the early birds. That's not easy to do, especially on a week uh, like this where you got multiple days, but we really appreciate it. And I know that you're going to get a treat here in just a moment. I want to remind you again um, about the, the lecture book in particular, uh, nearly 600 pages of material. You know, I think you've kind of gotten a sense of it if you've been at any of the lectures. This has been a very in-depth study that's been done and put in work into print. Uh, so the $20 price on that book right now is a steal of a deal. You're basically getting a commentary uh, on all of this, and uh, that's, that's a good price. So that will change following this week. So I would encourage you to get one while you're here, maybe get one for a friend and uh, take along with you as well. Um, before we get started this morning, Chris Reeves will lead us in prayer, but Kyle will come also and introduce our speaker. It's good to see everyone again this morning as we are in our last day of the lectures. And as we've begun each morning, we've been looking at uh, what we've called supernatural things. As we face critics in the world, sometimes that issue of supernatural aspects that are taught in Scripture are some of the most challenging. And this morning, Brother Spencer Blackwelder is going to talk to us about, I believe, that Jesus cast out demons. And so we look forward to that. Spencer is married to Diane. They've been married 33 years and have three grown sons. Uh, in 1997, he and his wife moved to Danville, Florida, where as a result of the influence and teaching of his uncle Charlie, they both obeyed the gospel the same hour of the night, and we rejoice in that. Uh, they have committed themselves to the Lord's work since that time. Uh, he, they have lived a number of places throughout the country, in Minnesota, uh, Florida, and he's currently in Texas. He was a deacon in Minnesota at the New Hope Congregation for about 10 years. Uh, he currently preaches at the Franklin and Juniper Congregation in Borger, Texas. And that's how I first got to know Spencer. Borger is about an hour away from Amarillo, where I live. And Spencer has helped us a few times in our summer Bible studies, and he's done an excellent job. And so uh, that's one reason that I commended him for uh, our work that we're going to engage in today. Uh, he is very active in personal work. If you talk to him, as you probably noticed from some of his comments in the open forum yesterday, he's very interested in how you can reach other people for the cause of Christ. And as he gave me some notes uh, about his bio, he made the statement that it is his hope that uh, he can help encourage saints to be ready to give a defense, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. So we look forward to the lesson he'll bring us this morning, but before we turn things over to him, let's go to God in prayer. Let's humbly bow. Great God and Father in heaven, you are great and greatly to be praised. We recognize this day that you have given us as the sun rises, that it is a day that you have made and we rejoice in it. We recognize that our days are limited on this earth and we pray that we would use every waking moment in your service. We're thankful for another day of life. We recognize that there are others around us who are less fortunate. They have ailments and illnesses and problems, and we are able to be here this morning, be with those who struggle with issues and help them, and be with us this morning as we open up our minds and open up our Bibles to the truths that you have for us. We are grateful for the revelation that we hold in our hands that tells us about your son, Jesus Christ, and all of these things that we can remind ourselves about this week, that he came to save us, he came to give us an example, he came to 
continue to be our high priest in heaven, our intercessor. And it's good to be reminded of all the good that you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit have done for us. We are the spiritual beneficiaries of these great things. And we thank you for that. We're reminded this morning of the miracles showing your power. And we believe that that power continues to exist to this day. You uphold all things by the word of your mouth. And by you, all things consist and hold together. And we're thankful for your providential power that continues to rule and reign in our lives and the lives of all individuals in this world. We pray that you would continue to watch over the affairs of this nation and be with our leaders that we might live a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and world leaders and that changes would be made to bring man's will into conformity to your will. Give us time to understand that righteousness exalts this nation and sin is a reproach to any people. We pray that we might take this message of Jesus today and this week and talk with others about your son so that they can have the same blessings that we have. We're thankful for the individuals who have planned these things this week. We appreciate their interest in spiritual things and Bible study and the hard work that goes into that. We appreciate our brethren who sacrifice and serve us in these kinds of lessons. And we pray that good fruit would be born as the seed of your word is sown in our hearts and as the message gets out in the printed material and may we take the message as that message is sent out we pray that good would be accomplished and all to your glory this is our prayer in jesus name amen satan has more power in the minds of the masses, it seems, than the triune God himself. And what I wanted to talk to you today about is about that problem, because people are hurting, people are suffering, they have pain, they have troubles in their lives, and in many cases I've found that they're attributing it to Satan, uh, and likely, rightfully so, but they take it a little bit further. They attribute it to the demon possession, uh, the literal possession of Satan. And we got to talk about that. I have a, uh, in one of my efforts to talk with some folks, I met a lady whose son, adult son, tragically uh, passed away from the abuse of alcohol. And that was tragic. But during the discussion with her, she said this, and this is pretty much a direct quote. She said that he was taken over by Satan. And she was referring to the literal demon possession of Satan that caused that, that problem. Additionally, she went on to say about his, talk about his salvation. Uh, and, and your heart just weeps because now you're in this position where you have to try to talk to folks that is contrary to what they believe. People believe a lot of things that just ain't so. So we're going to have to talk about that a little bit. Uh, my specific uh, job is to, uh, we'll see if, the, if I'm mashing the right button. Probably not. There we go. My, my specific job today is to talk to you about Jesus casting out Satan and the accusation that he cast out Satan with the power of Beelzebub. But, but we, I was also tasked to talk about those mental illnesses, those, those things, those changes in people's behavior that many attribute to demon possession today. We need to talk about that as well. 
And then finally, I'm going to try to talk to you about a defense for that uh, when you have people that are receptive, of course. Not everybody's receptive. And so hopefully uh, here in the few minutes that I have, uh, we can talk about all of those things and get some clarity on that. This is a serious problem. Uh, error is being taught about demon possession. In the denominational world, we're certain of that. But what's surprising is we're seeing and hearing a lot of that among our brethren. Uh, let me just say this. This is an aside. Uh, I was talking to Rick Billingsley, and uh, he's a very evangelistic guy. And uh, it, it, I was reminded, especially during the open forum, that a friend of mine said one time, evangelism is messy. <laughs> and what he meant by that is because people come from outside and they have these lives, these these beliefs and these things, and uh, there's only a little bit of information they need to know at first to become Christians, but then they begin the growing process, hopefully, but, but they're among us, and we have to help them, and sometimes these beliefs creep in, uh, accidentally, I guess, not intentionally, and we have to be ready to help teach folks, and that's what I'm seeing this purpose today, is as an opportunity to um, help some brethren and uh, help us as we go and talk to people out in the world. Thank you for letting me be here. I'm a, it's a pleasure. Thanks, Kyle, for bringing me here, right? Uh, nobody here knows me, and that's okay. I don't know any of you either. <laughs> but we know one another in Christ, and that's all that's important to me at this moment. I'm the least of all the speakers, and that's fine. My intent is not to come here and to be known. My intent is to come here and to share the truth about demon possession and about the power of God so that we might be able to give a defense to those who are uh, who ask us of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. Before we get too far in, we kind of have to identify the problem, I guess. Uh, we have to identify, I guess I did that wrong. We have to identify who we're talking about. Uh, forgive the little cartoonish devils, but I did that by intent because uh, the, you don't know what he looks like. <laughs> the only description you have of Satan is in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and he says that he appears as an angel of light, but movie in Hollywood has him uh, this red, fork-tongued, horned, long-tailed guy, and that's that's imaginary, so I might as well use a comical one just as much as I use a, one of those uh, demoniac-looking ones. But we need to identify what's going on here with regard to Satan and who we're talking about. I, whenever you talk to people and you tell them that you don't believe in demon possession, they're like, oh, you don't believe in Satan? Yes, I believe in Satan. Of course I do. The scriptures talk about it. Our Savior identifies him. In John chapter 8, and verse 44, he describes him clearly. I'm going to try to go to some passages. I won't be able to go to all, uh, but there's notes in the book, of course. Uh, I guess that's a plug to buy the book, I suppose. Uh, but uh, certainly I want you all to do your own studies on these things as well. But our Savior identifies him in John chapter 8. He says in verse 44, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He, our Savior, has identified Satan as a real person. And of course, we know he uh, dealt with the demoniac world in Mark chapter 5. Uh, when he spoke to uh, the legion that were there and he cast out uh, the legion. And you can see them communicating and identifying Christ. Do you remember they had, in Mark chapter 5... They, the demoniac, knew who he was. And so certainly he's real. But that wasn't the first place we ever heard about him. We hear about him all the way back at the beginning in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve. And he was disguised as a serpent, right? And of course, they weren't afraid of him. Of course not. Uh, they were there and unashamed and unafraid of things before the fall. But it's there that we first meet uh, Satan in that serpent. And of course, Paul would write about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, talking about how uh, Satan, the devil, beguiled Eve. And so certainly he's real. We know also 
with regards to the temptation of Christ, uh, that he is real because he, Satan himself was the one that was uh, tempting Christ in the wilderness. And you can turn to the, the occasion I have written in Matthew chapter uh, 4. And you can follow that along. We're not going to read that section. I'm just going to point it out to you. The, the threefold temptation. And we see the interaction there. We see movement. We see someone who has understanding and communication. And he quotes scripture. And he's, uh, Jesus responds to him with scripture. And there's a lot to be said about that. And this is not that discussion. But I encourage you to go back and look at the temptation of Christ. The threefold temptation. Certainly, uh, Satan quoted scripture. That was one of the lines someone gave to me one time. I was trying to quote scripture. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Rick said the other day, when you're having a Bible discussion with people, have the Bible open so you can avoid these kind of discussions, right? But I was quoting scriptures to a young uh, person, a clerk at Walmart uh, in the break room or whatever. I wasn't working there. They were doing the break room in the front and subway. I don't understand that. But beside the point, we're talking to them. And I was quoting some scripture to them, and they believed these beliefs about demon possession and whatnot. And, and she looked at me, and she said, Satan quoted scripture too. Oh, yeah, he sure did. <laughs> he just didn't do it right. So have your Bible out there. Uh, so we see that he's real, and he was there, and he, was, uh, he tempted Jesus. We know that the apostles had to deal with him. Uh, the apostles write about them. Of course, we know Paul cast out a demon in uh, Acts chapter 16. And uh, Paul, of course, wrote about them. And Peter writes about them in 1 Peter 5. We'll get to that here in a little bit. Uh, but I want you to see that they thought he was real also. And so we think he's real. We should. And then lastly, I want to note with regards to uh, the reality of Satan, it, it, he has a name and many names and many descriptions. Jesus gives him uh, many names. He's called Satan in Revelation 12, 9. He's called Beelzebub in Mark 3, 22. That's where the accusation uh, that they give against Christ uh, comes from. They recognize Jesus as God's son in Matthew 8. Uh, they recognize Paul as God's servant in Acts chapter 16. Demons are unclean spirits that can reason. They knew of coming judgment against them. Demons, James chapter 2, verse 19, tells us they believe and they tremble. And if it's merely an illness, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, uh, then how do we account for the supernatural strength that you see with regards to those that were demon possessed in the first century. And how do you account for the reaction of the herd of swine if it's just some illness that some people are claiming today? And so Satan, I believe, is real. He's absolutely real. But because he's real, because he's a reality, uh, that seems redundant, I guess. Uh, because he's real, um, does that mean that he's uh, unlimited? And we have to talk about that next. Uh, I guess I, I see the advance now. I, I figured out technology. Look at that. We have to talk about his abilities today. While Satan is real, he is not omnipotent. He does not have unlimited power. Uh, I'm going to partially show, and you're going to have to do some more of your own research, that Satan is bound today. He was allowed at a, at the, during the first century to possess, and the demons were allowed to possess, but that was for a purpose. But today, we don't have that problem. Starting with uh, the casting out of Satan in Mark chapter 3, uh, Jesus cast him out, and the accusation was is that he cast him out by the power of Beelzebub. Uh, that's an attempt by desperate men who are trying to cling on to power. You know how desperate people do when they are encountered with something that they don't like and they can't explain. Uh, they demonize it. Then they emotionalize it, right? Then they threaten. Uh, I call this the, the uh, progression of, uh, of uh, persecution. And that's what they were doing here. And in Mark chapter 3, uh, when he was casting out Bales above Satan. He's, he's doing it to identify himself. 
And Jesus responds. He gives a threefold response in the, uh, the way that he describes it. It says in Mark chapter 3 and verse 22, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casts he out devils. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? Uh, look at the three responses. Number one, And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. There's your first answer. Jesus responds with logic and reasoning. Seems reasonable. Uh, number two, If a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And then third, he says, if Satan rise against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. Folks, that's so important. He has an end. And really, the Old Testament had predicted that end. Back in Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 2, we see the prediction of that end. The Old Testament teaches that evil spirits and demons would depart. In Zechariah 13 and verse 2 it says, uh, referring to the age of the messianic period, uh, the, the promise is this, I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to pass out of the land. Of course, this is fulfilled in the Gospels as the disciples were able to cast out demons. And Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Luke chapter 10 verses 18 through 20. This shows the lesser power of Satan. As I said in the opening, many people uh, seem to believe that Satan has more power because uh, demon possession seems to be more prevalent than anything else. But this shows that he has a limited power. Uh, his angels have a limited power. And Peter and Jude uh, refer to those spirit, that spirit realm, those spirit beings, those evil spirits as being in chains and bound. Uh, Jude chapter 1 and verse 6. And so we need to see that, uh, that it happened during a time, during the New Testament time, during the change of the covenant. Think about this for a second. How would you, not that you can be, if you were to be given a message for a new covenant, how would you prove that you're from God? Well, the, the scriptures tells us how to know that. You have to be able to do a miracle. You have to be able to prove it. You have to be able to demonstrate it. Because if you're going to come on the scene and you're going to tell everybody that this is over and this is new, you better show something about it. And one of the things that Jesus did and the apostles did is they did these extraordinary, undeniable, unusual miracles, one of which was casting out demons. Certainly there were many things that they were able to do. I want to show you and talk to you about that for a second these undeniable, unusual signs, one of which was certainly casting out Satan. They had, Jesus has power over the spirit world. That's a good lesson. You could preach that probably, Chris, right? We also see the miracle that he did with regards to knowing the inner personal thoughts of man. Jesus did that. He could do that. He had that power. And he used it on a few occasions uh, when folks were thinking certain things. He would call them out. We see the miracles that he had in giving uh, life-sustaining food, right? You see the feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000. Of course, that was, again, to demonstrate his power. It wasn't a, a command for uh, perpetuity uh, to give food miraculously. Even the manna ceased after they crossed the Jordan. And then we see the power he had over nature. God is almighty and the, certainly the creation that he made was within his control when he calmed the storm with a few words, peace be still. Phenomenal. Phenomenal power. And then, of course, we see the healing of sicknesses and the power he has over the body, our bodies. And all of those, if you'll pay attention carefully, especially to those that are watching TV and movies and getting their theology from the radio, all of those things, people believe, still kind of occur today. Uh, of course, mo much of it is they exemplify it with the speaking of tongues, which is 
according to the scriptures, the least of all the spiritual gifts. And so, but Jesus was doing that to demonstrate his power and to demonstrate his identity, to confirm that he was from God, that his message, the new covenant was from God. And it's consistent with the entirety, the record of the Old Testament as well, because this is what happened when the old covenant, the law of Moses occurred. It was at the heels of many miraculous events. And so even though Satan is real, he's limited and he is bound. Uh, uh, transition, people are looking at that word Nazi there and they're wondering, what's that all about? Well, what, what I'm trying to show you using that uh, analogy is that Satan, even though he may be bound, his teaching still uh, circulates. There are no modern, there are no uh, Nazis from Nazi Germany today. If the, it, I think I saw in the news a hundred year old guy got caught and was arrested, sent to prison or whatever. One of the last remaining Nazis in the world from the World War II. But we all know absolutely that even though uh, Hitler is dead, and even if you believe the theories that he didn't die, but he, he certainly by now he's dead, his influence is still in our world today. Because people follow that teaching because of their own lust and their own desires. They still follow those teachings. Marxists, you know, Marx is gone. But they're still Marxists today. So people follow those teachings. For 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I wanted you to go there uh, with me real quickly. Uh, kind of demonstrates that it's not necessary to do demon possession. People can be followers of Satan on their own desires and their own lusts and their own motivations. And, and, and Paul writes that they're like uh, ministers of Satan. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, talking about false apostles and deceitful workers, verse 13, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. If you look at that closely, he's not talking about demon possession. He's talking about people who, out of their own motivations, their own lusts, their own desires, are followers of Satan, ministers of Satan. But then somebody will say, well, what about 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse, 9, verse 8? Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll go ahead and read that. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. That's a true statement. But we got to remember that Peter dealt with the walking about lion during his time. That was, that was certain. Paul cast out demons. <clears throat> and then you had those uh, sons of Sceva who attempted to cast out demons in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Of course, they didn't recognize them. And so that was a true statement. And there's a couple of other passages we could look at uh, that really point to the speci specific audience of that day. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 comes to mind with the regulation of spiritual gifts in the church. Uh, we take lessons from that still today, but generally speaking, uh, generally speaking, uh, absolutely speaking, uh, we don't have to deal with the regulation of speaking in tongues today inside the congregation in our worships. Because we don't have that spiritual gift. I know I just opened up a can of worms for some people that might be listening, but we'll talk about that in a minute too. But what's the lesson for us today from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8? The influence of Satan and those that follow his teachings that are liars and murderers and deceitful and all those types of things that we can read about in all these other passages, uh, 2 Timothy 3 comes to mind and others, that is still surrounding us everywhere and ready to devour those who are not paying attention to your own heart, to your own lusts. And so certainly it's true, but I want to read the next verse because we often create a doctrine off of one verse. Have you ever noticed that? People often create a doctrine out of one verse. And that's good because they can isolate the context, make it mean something that it doesn't mean. But look back at the passage there. 
It says in verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. There's your answer, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished by your brother there in the world. Other people are dealing with it too. What's the answer? Resist steadfast in the faith. I made a comment the other day about the seven senses of faith and how that's used. One of the senses we need to remember and understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How did Jesus combat Satan in the temptation? He says it is written. How do you combat the teaching of Satan, the error of Satan, and those people that are trying to promote those things? You say it is written and show them this good book. <clears throat> and so we shouldn't have to worry about all of those things. Evil is real, but it is definitely not equal to God. The fourth re response that Jesus has to the accusation about him casting out demons through the power of Beelzebub, casting out Satan by the power of Be Beelzebub, would only come later after his death and burial. Three days after his burial, he would be resurrected. <clears throat> And Jesus did rise from the dead. And that resurrection is our victory. It's our hope. It's the key of everything. <laughs> Let me pause here for a second and just try to emphasize this point for you. All the discussions we've had this week, they, they cling to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And that resurrection became a promise to us that we one day will be resurrected also. And read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18 about those who have hope versus those who have no real hope. We that are in Christ Jesus can have hope in the resurrection and the deliverance from all this pain of the world that we suffer and all the dealings that we have to... to to deal with. And Paul's discussion in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about those things. He, he, after he lays out the tenets of the gospel in which you are saved, in which you stand, of course that's talking about the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now you cannot deny uh, the, the symbolism of uh, baptism, uh, the, the saving uh, saving effects of baptism in water because it mirrors the death, burial in water, and the resurrection to walk in newness of life as described in Romans 6, 3 and 4. 1 Peter 3, 21, baptism doth also now save us. We're looking forward to the resurrection as well. But Paul uses that as the, as the key point to describe why he would be able to and why he would want to endure so many things. It was the reason for his preaching, for his evangelism. He says in verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now those are among the saints. There are some uh, that were among the saints evidently that were saying there's no resurrection from the dead. We deal with that today because we have unbelievers who say that there's no resurrection from the dead. And I haven't met a saint yet that says that, but if I do, I'm going to go back and quote this section. But it's the purpose we preach. Folks, there is no hope for anyone in this world, not through politics, not through causes, not through looking for cures for diseases, not for anything in this life. The only hope we have is resurrection from the dead, from this dead world. <clears throat> That's the only hope we have. And I don't know if we emphasize that enough sometimes, but it's the reason we go out and preach and to talk to people. He says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead be not raised. And so it's the whole purpose that we get into this uh, job called evangelism, called preaching. And certainly we spend some of our time preaching to one another, and that's good. We're trying to equip one another. That's good. But we need to get out in front of folks to heal them, to help them, 
to get rid of those influence of Satan in their lives so that they can have hope. But Paul goes on. It's also the assurance that our sins have been removed. You see, God can have no part of sin. James chapter 1, verse 17, a great verse that I enjoy talking about all the time. Uh, every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from above the Father of lights with whom is no variation, neither shadow of turning. If you look at that closely and you understand that there is there's no spot on God. He can't have anything to do with sin. And so to be resurrected, to have that promise of the resurrection, we have to have some means to have our sins washed away. And Paul talks about that. He says, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, yet you are instilled in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep, talking about those that are dead in Christ, have perished, are perished. Contrast that with 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, with regards to talking about those who are dead in Christ. They, they had the hope of the resurrection and that their sins are removed. He goes on after he does a little discussion about the entrance of sin in the world through Adam, through the one man. He goes back to this discussion about why we preach, why we will endure certain things, uh, the assurance of sin. But then he starts to talk about why he's willing to endure injury, why he's in, willing to endure suffering and persecution. He says over there, 1 Corinthians 15, look at it at verse 29. He says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? Folks, whenever you see baptism, just know this. Uh, most of the people, the denominational world, are talking about spiritual uh, baptism, Holy Spirit baptism. But folks, you can't do that. It's implied in the text. If it's a command that you can do, it's something that you're able to do, and it's always pointing to water baptism. Folks, we need to pay attention to that. Just remember that. How do people see these passages and think something else? You're like, because they're thinking something else. And we have to help show them the way. But go, continue on. He says, and why stand you in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus. Our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with the beasts of Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Who cares? Just don't mess with it. Don't get into trouble. Don't, don't make anybody mad, I guess. And of course, don't misinterpret that. I'm not out there to try to make people mad by preaching the truth. But when you preach the truth, it makes people mad sometimes. I can't help it. But we can speak the truth in love. We can season our words with salt. We can try to help folks. But at the end of the day, in many cases, you're still going to end up suffering persecution. Let me just warn you folks who are not preaching the gospel actively, and I'm not making an accusation to anybody, I just, it's, it's somewhat of a reality, you know, we, we work and we support the gospel, I appreciate that. But I want you to know that living godly in Christ Jesus will bring about persecution just because of the contrast. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12 all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. First Peter, by the way, is a great book to describe suffering and why and how you can endure it. The why is chapter 1, by the way. The why you want to, the why you can, the why you ought to is in chapter 1. The rest of the book is, is what's going to happen. It says there a favorite verse of mine. It says, don't think it's strange about the fiery trial, right? That's kind of funny. We think it's strange. False expectations, I suppose. We walk around thinking that life isn't going to be hard and life isn't going to be full of persecution. Life isn't going to be full of diseases. I'm asking the question, where'd you get that? Where'd you get that idea? That expectation. I think that's part of the problem is we have these expectations of, of heaven on earth and that's not going to be there. And Paul had no expectation. And because of the resurrection of Christ, he was willing to suffer injury and illness and all sorts of persecution for that cause. But at the end of the chapter, in chapter 15, 50 through 58, he talks about the victory that we have in Christ. And he points and he's describing the resurrection. Of course, people in that particular section are asking the question, well, what's it going to look like? What are we going to do? What are we gonna do? Asking all these questions that aren't revealed. And Paul says, you fool. And he gives an answer, but I want to just read the last couple of sections here. It says in verse 55, it says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection is so important. So important for us. 
Let's talk about that. Let's emphasize that. Let's point that when we're talking about baptism. People say we often overemphasize baptism uh, to the detriment of belief. And I'm like, well, people, most people I come in contact all were already believe to some degree. And that's why we had to talk about baptism more. But I think we need to remind them of the resurrection. And so there's some of the answers there for you with regards to the victory. The reason for our hope is in Christ Jesus. He says in 15 and verse 19, go back. Uh, he, he says, I think I already uh, read it once. If this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable in this life. The hope is in the next. <coughs> Let's briefly talk about mental illness and maybe... I may not be able to go through the rest, but that's okay. You can buy the book. There you go. I did it for you, Lance. Got you. That, folks, it's, we're, that's not the point. We're trying to get information out to help people is what we're trying to do. But people are walking around thinking that some of the mental illnesses that are going on in this life are caused by demon possession. There's a variety of reasons. Some of it outside of people's control, some of it within people's control. Some of it was within people's control and then it became outside of their control because of uh, burning their brain cells with drugs and alcohol and things of that sort. Uh, but, but here's the part that I want to talk about is they also make the claim that once you cross over into that area where you're no longer reasonable, rational, and unable to change, then you are now safe and going to heaven. That can't be true. That's, that's, that would be a second way to go to God, right? Through either demon possession or brain injury, right? Instead of evangelizing with the Bible, let's evangelize with the bat and make sure that everybody goes to heaven. That doesn't make sense. There's only one way to God, and it's through Christ Jesus, through His blood. <clears throat> But we need to be reminded of what happened at the fall because if we're not, then we'll be mistaken about what's going on in our physical lives. Sometimes, uh, even in our physical realm, uh, we are shocked that people get sick and we're shocked that people die, as tragic as those things are. My mother died young, and uh, I say young, I'm older than me, but uh, younger than she ought. It shouldn't come as a surprise to us because in the fall, three things, at least three things came into, into being during the fall in Genesis chapter 3. Certainly we all know that death came into the world. Both spiritual and physical death entered into the world. The tree of life was taken away. And it's only available to those that are in Christ uh, through the resurrection of Christ in the hope of going to heaven. <clears throat> we also know that after that, illness and injuries and all sorts of diseases uh, manifested themselves. And we see it in leprosy in Naaman, 2 Kings chapter 5. We see it in the blind man, John 9, verse 1. We see it in so many places in deafness and disease and illness and injury and all sorts of stuff. All of that is, is, can be connected to Satan in the sense of the Garden of Eden, but it can't necessarily be connected to your own personal sin. See, that's a teaching that's out there, that if you're suffering some sort of an illness or injury or something like that, then you must be in some sort of sin. I had a friend of mine who uh, complained. He's in a denomination that teaches faith healing. Of course, their faith that they're healing in is shaken because there is no, there, there is no faith healing like that. But he said to me, he says, after he had gone through the anointing of oil and the uh, the faith healing and the laying on of hands of the elders that he talked about in their denomination. He says, I, I still have this terrible disease. He says, I don't know what I've done. How sad. How sad. You see, if we can change our attitude and change our perspective about what's going on in the world, then we can teach people the truth about these matters. Before then, we're kind of stuck. And I'll say this, it doesn't take the pain away, but Paul had a change in attitude when he was calling about his thorn in the flesh. If you remember, he just had a perspective change. It didn't take away the pain. I'm certain it still hurt as much as it hurt when he was praying to the Lord three times. But he had a perspective change. And it began to help him. And that's how we can help others. 
The third thing is kind of not always noticeable is the emotional change that mankind had at the fall. Before the fall, before the eating of that fruit, uh, they were naked and unashamed. But after the fall, after they ate the fruit, they were afraid. Of course, they were afraid towards God. And people often say, you know, if, if fear is in your church or shame is in your church, you're in the wrong church. You're like, I don't know how you can talk to people about sin unless you talk about fear and shame. We need to remember that Paul preached. He says, there, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Why would you have to know about the terror of the Lord? Because if you're not in Christ, you're going to face his vengeance. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, 8 and 9. And so that's what we need to remember about the fall, at the beginning of the fall. I'm probably expiring my time, but I want to just kind of work through this exercise a little bit with regards to whether or not a person who loses accountability through uh, the change of their mental ability, are they now safe? Let's reason together, folks. Let's work this out. <clears throat> we know from Scripture, by faith, right, I, I'm redundant, that if a child is born, when a child is born in the world, that he is safe because he's not accountable, because he doesn't have the ability to reason yet, to believe. A person, in order to come to faith, must be able to believe. And so God doesn't impute sin to them. And some of the passages are like in Mark 10, especially the child of David in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, about verse 23. We know that he's safe. That he doesn't have reasoning skills. Uh, we don't know when the age of accountability is, but when it comes, then he needs to obey the gospel. We also know that if a person is born in this world and they reach the age of accountability and they reach a long life, but they never obey the gospel, they're lost, right? As it, and when they die, there's no, no chance, no hope. There's no second chance. And then if a person loses the function of the brain, if they grow, uh, well, before that, if a, child, if a person comes in, uh, grow, uh, grows up into the age of accountability, but they die young, right? Through a tragedy or illness or disease or something like that, but they're accountable and they get a brain injury <clears throat> or they die, let's say, talk about they die, even if they die at a young age, they're going to be accountable and they're potentially going to be lost. This talks about the urgency of the gospel, of spreading the gospel. Now let's talk about brain injury. Let's say somebody gets into an auto accident or they get some sort of a disease like dementia. My, my wife is at home now caring for uh, her mother who has dementia. And uh, the progression is horrible. I don't know when they lose reason, but at some point they lose their uh, rational ability to understand things. Maybe... Maybe if somebody has an auto accident, they, they uh, lose the function of their brain. Are they now safe like the child? Are they now on the baby ticket? The answer is no. God is going to hold them accountable to the time when they were reasonable and rational. And I don't know when they lost their ability to use their brain, but when they did, God knows. He's almighty. He's omniscient. And it doesn't become an escape clause to salvation separate and apart from the blood of Christ. And so, too, we must also conclude that that's true about the folks who suffer mental illness through a variety of reasons and causes, and none of which I'm expert enough to explain. We have to speak the truth to people. And it really, all of this really boils down to is the urgency of the gospel. Life is a vapor. It's here and it's gone. Ask any of the older folks. I don't want to point to any one of them, but uh, ask any of them if life was long or short, and chances are it went by pretty quick. And I feel the same way too. <clears throat> and so the last thing I'll say and the answer, and forgive me for going beyond the time, but part of the answer we need to give to people is to show uh, that those spiritual things had a purpose and they ceased. Here's the thing you need to know and be aware of. Every single person, this is of course anecdotal, but it's been 100% so far, every single person I've met that believes in demon possession and ghosts and goblins and all that kind of stuff, they also hold to the error of the personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit today. Ask them. They'll tell you. They're not ashamed of it. 
they also hold to that same belief. And certainly, the personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit occurred back then, but does it occur today? And the answer is no. The miracle age has ceased because it served a purpose. Uh, quickly, to confirm the word, uh, Mark 16, 20, and Hebrews 2, 3. Uh, the word was confirmed through signs and wonders. And I've already listed the signs, the Satan and the uh, inner thoughts and the giving of food and the natural stuff and the sickness. He, uh, those things were there to confirm the message and the messengers of God. The epistles were certainly inspired by the Holy Spirit. And they are there for us today. John 20, I love to read this and read it with uh, Ephesians 3, 3 and 4. But uh, John 20, <clears throat> and I use this almost every day, talking about the miracle that, of the resurrection. Uh, Thomas got to witness that. But in verse 30 it says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, but which are not written in this book. But these are written... That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. And I ask people, how do you know how to believe? And they say, well, Holy Spirit. What does the text say? you got to read what is written. Jesus delegated the authority of the Holy Spirit to the apostles who were able to pass on spiritual gifts. Not to pa They were able to pass on spiritual gifts, but... The, the, the role of the apostle was never passed on. And you can read about that in uh, John 16, 13. You can also read and see that in action in uh, Acts chapter 8. The scriptures are now, the written scriptures are now complete. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we always say 16 to 17. Start saying 15 to 17, and if you go look that up, you'll figure out why. Uh, but we need to recognize it's the scriptures, the written word that we have today. And that was the purpose that they did those things is to bring about us the written word, the New Testament scriptures. Certainly the Holy Spirit was active in the first century. First Corinthians 14, I talked to you about that earlier, is there to edify the church while the word was being codified. <coughs> And so we don't deny the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Certainly it was personal and direct then for the apostles. But for us today, it's through the agency of the written word that was inspired by the Holy Spirit as holy men of God were moved to write. And then, therefore, we conclude that demon possession must be over also. It has to be. Because it was one of the signs. It was one of the signs to confirm the identity of Christ, the power of Christ, the message of Christ, all of those things. Now here's, the, here's the answer. How would you do it if it was still occurring today? You wouldn't have the ability. You, there's no apostles around to give you that ability. And so therefore, God will not allow it to happen. That's an inescapable conclusion 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, talks about uh, God is faithful, right? Uh, matter of fact, I know we, we, we probably are tired and it's 8 in the morning, 9 in the morning. We want to get on with it, right? But I want to end with this <clears throat> and make you think, think about this for a second. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, it says, There has no temptation taken you. But such is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make it a way, make it a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. People believe that demon possession is more powerful than God. Folks, it's not true. It doesn't occur. He won't allow it. And the Bible student knows these things already. They've read Job. Uh, they've read the, through the New Testament. They know some of these things. And now it's our job to go out and help people through these things because it's creeping in. It's coming in. And as we do our job effectively, we're going to have to uh, face it. And so let me just close out by saying thank you. Uh, I invite you to study these things, prove them out for yourselves. Uh, in the book, there's going to be a section about why these things comfort me and some possible reasons why people still believe that there's, there's possessed by demons. And I encourage you to go look at those last two things. But I take comfort in knowing the Almighty God has made a provision for all of these things through His Word, and that we can have hope if we look forward to the resurrection. May God bless you all. Thank you.
Thank you, Spencer. As you all can tell, Spencer brings an energy to his presentation, and he's excited about these things. I appreciate especially the point that he made that, you know, we are not talking about co-equal entities when we're talking about God and Satan. God is always more powerful and will have the victory. Let me echo one last thing, and we'll take just a few minutes. Uh, when he was uh, hesitant about plugging the book, let me just kind of remind folks, uh, Truth Publications is a nonprofit organization. We exist for the purpose of offering materials and any cost, any money that comes in from the sale of books goes back into the production of these materials, especially when we're talking about the Truth Lectures. There aren't even royalties that are paid. Now, on those books where there are royalties, you ask some of the authors and you'll see that's a very minimal kind of offering to the author, but please understand, as we try to promote these things, it's not a financial issue. It's a matter of trying to get the Word of God out and to help people have good materials, and I would commend as well the book. It certainly will be a great resource, I think, long after our time together is gone. Let's take about five minutes. Thank you.
All right, we're going to ask everybody to come on back to seats. We had a little bit of a shorter break at this session, but we want to keep on time, so it is the top of the hour. If you will, go ahead and be making your way back into your seats. I want to remind you of a couple of things. Again, today, uh, Suzanne's Bakery will be over at the bookstore through the middle of the day hours if you want to get some treats there. I uh, also want to remind you that the ladies' lecture at 11 is in the lunchroom. That's different this year. Children's class in the library. I'm having zero impact on the people in the back. <laughs> Let's come on in and take our seats. It's 9 o'clock. We've got to get started. <laughs> All right. Come on in. Let's have our seats so we can get started with our 9 o'clock lecture. Appreciate everybody being here. We've got an excellent crowd this morning as well. All right, uh, one more time just for y'all's benefit. Suzanne's Bakery will be at the bookstore again today with treats uh, and goodies and such. So might check that out. I think yesterday they had chicken salad and uh, strawberry pretzel salad and stuff like that. might be a little early to think about that, but you know, you'll be thinking about it later. Um, and then uh, remember tonight, singing at 7. Be sure you come early, get a good seat, sit down front, uh, or else I'll encourage you to do so anyway. Um, We'll turn it over to Kyle now, though, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Before I introduce the lecture, uh, it came to my attention, uh, those, the Truth Lectures first began in connection with uh, semi-annual board meetings uh, in connection with those who are members of the, the board. And if you are a board member and didn't get the email or didn't notice the email, we are having a board meeting after this morning's lectures uh, in the library. So uh, please uh, make plans to, to do that. Now this track of our morning lectures deals with the identity of Christ. And as we've looked this week, we began talking about that Jesus is the Son of Man. Uh, we talked yesterday about the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, and today we're going to talk about the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. And it's my honor to, represent, to introduce uh, Sean Chancellor. Both of the men that I've introduced this morning are from what we call the Panhandle of Texas, so we're kind of making an, an impact. We're creeping in here, so y'all better watch out. Uh, but I'm excited to introduce Sean. Uh, Sean and his wife Bonnie live in Amarillo, Texas. Uh, they have a daughter that lives there as well. Uh, she's married now, and uh, he has preached in Bradley, Arkansas, and my son-in-law's grandparents worshiped in Bradley, where he uh, preached. He's also preached in Fort Smith, but for the past eight years, he has preached for the South Georgia congregation in Amarillo, and I preach at the Olson Park congregation in Amarillo, and we've come to uh, get to know each other, and we appreciate the good work. Uh, for the last few years, he's also served as an elder there, and he too, like Spencer that I mentioned at the beginning, has helped us in our summer Bible studies a few years and has done an excellent job. Uh, he also, he and I have participated in some young people's home Bible studies that, uh, that we've had, and we appreciate one another in, in that good work. Um, I have kind of a connection to Sean, even before he moved to Amarillo. His grandparents worshipped where I preached at Sun Valley in Birmingham years ago. Uh, his father went to school with my brother, and then when my brother taught at Florida College, uh, Sean was in my brother's class, and so I kind of had some connections to him even before he moved uh, to Amarillo, and so we appreciate that. Sean has written a number of articles in Truth Magazine, uh, some of which have even been featured in the appendix of uh, some of our lecture books. Uh, back in 2019, when we had a lectureship uh, taking his hand, helping each other home. Sean did an excellent lesson for us on spiritual growth in the home, and I would commend that to you. And as we've mentioned, the four men who've helped with our lectures this year that kind of inspired it because of the work they've done on apologetics, 
Bruce Reeves, Shane Carrington, Tyler Sams, and Sean uh, have done a series uh, in different congregations around the country that, Lord willing, very soon will be in a book entitled, Is It Reasonable to Believe in God? So I offer you to pay your kind attention to Sean Chancellor. Well, good morning. It is so good to be here this morning. Good to be with you. Good to have the opportunity to talk about the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I, I love coming to this area. My parents live here. I went to high school just down the road in Rogersville, but I was telling my wife as we drove in, I love being here, but it's awkward too. I'm always afraid somebody's going to walk up and say, I remember you uh, from high school. And uh, hopefully that would be a good thing, but I, I remember some things I wish others might forget. Uh, but it is good to be here this morning. Our first passage we'll be looking at is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You might go ahead and open your Bibles to that. It'll be a moment before we get there, though. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I think this statement, this confession lies at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian. I don't know if there's anything that we can utter or be convinced of that is more powerful than that fact. It's the heart of our confession that we make as we enter into Christ, as we seek His salvation and the forgiveness that He can offer. These words have this power not because of the words themselves, but because God in the flesh defeated sin, freed us from death. Through Him we have the hope of the resurrection Brother Blackwelder was talking about a few moments ago in Him and through Him. We have the hope of heaven in our heart. If Jesus is not the Son of God, we have none of those things. It's such an important concept for us to understand. This phrase, the Son of God, is used in a lot of different ways. I think a lot of times we use this term to distinguish the second person of the Godhead from the Father and from the Holy Spirit. And certainly there are times we need to do that in our conversation. But in our Bibles, we see the Son of God used to refer to His divine nature. John 10, 36. 40, John 1, 49. His role as Messiah, John eleven twenty seven, 27. His life-giving power, John chapter 5. The conversation there about the resurrection. There are other phrases like the Son or His Son, referring to God, that are used to describe His divine nature, John 1, 14 through 18. His role as a divine representative, Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. We'll look at that in a moment. The efficacy of His sacrifice, Romans chapter 8, verses 32 through 34, and His role as Redeemer of the faithful, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. I want to be very clear with you this morning. When I say that I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, I'm saying that Jesus of Nazareth is God in the flesh. I do not mean that a human was elevated to Godhood at His birth, or at His baptism, or at His resurrection. I believe that in the Incarnation, one of three eternally existent divine persons became flesh, as John tells us, and dwelt among us. Jesus, the incarnate God, has the exact nature possessed by the Father and by the Holy Spirit. He has all the authority inherent in that nature. He's the Son of God due to His divine nature and the specific roles given Him by the Father. Certainly not because of some evolution in the way the church came to see Him. And I think there are at least four facts that, that are worth our consideration as, as we enter into this discussion. First of all, and this, has been, this point has been made several times this week, I won't belabor it, but Jesus of Nazareth is a historical person. He comes from a background the world that if it wasn't for the Bible would really mean nothing to me or anyone else, and yet some 18 ancient historians write about him, mention his life, the reality that he lived. Not only that, he claims this Jesus, the Jesus of Nazareth, the Jesus of the New Testament, to be the Son of God. And we're going to talk about this this morning because I, I, it's strange to some of us, but I think it's important that we actually prove to people that the Bible actually does say that Jesus is the Son of God. The accounts of the resurrection are so powerful in this argument because it, it offers us an objective test for His claims to deity. 
And I don't want to trample too much on the speech tonight, but the resurrection of Jesus only because of the hope it gives us, but because it provides us with a litmus test. Either God entered into this realm and gave life to a dead man, or He did not. There is no in-between. If He did, He certifies every claim made in the Scriptures, particularly nature, His power, He is the Son of God. If God did not raise Jesus of Nazareth from the dead, nothing else. Anything. This book is not worth even holding in our hands, much less reading and studying. You and I have no hope for anything more than death. And last but not least, the apostles suffered and died taught that Jesus is the Son of God. And we're going to talk a little bit about this. It's very important for us to, to have our sort of use about the Scriptures, perhaps who doubt that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, a few things we need to talk about, and, and before we get into the, the text, I want to speak for just a moment about the opposite. And I spoke from a couple of different perspectives. Think about those who are atheists, those who just say there is no God. And I think sometimes that, that we're a little intimidated to encounter them, and I, I want to suggest we should not be. Oftentimes the atheists are, are going to present themselves as being highly educated. Many of them obviously are. Their names have been used this week. And they're going to use fancy terminology and scientific argument, all of this to, to paint a picture that says there cannot be a God. But at the root of all of that, there are two logical fallacies every atheist has to engage in. And because of that, brethren, I don't have to be a physicist to understand there is a God or to understand their argument doesn't work. First of all, they beg the question. They assume the very thing that has to be proven prove that God exists. I'm here to talk about Jesus being the Son of God, but if there is no God, then He's not. Every atheist, as was pointed out yesterday, steals the language of the Bible, steals the very concepts that God provides for us in order to make their argument, and then they say He doesn't exist. They want to talk about this world and everything in it. And then they say, God just popped into existence. Well, it's an illogical position. Something else they are going to appeal to, especially in this conversation, They're going to hold themselves to one set of rules and they want to hold us to In this question of, of the criticism of the Scriptures, the validity of the Scriptures, I think this is especially important because the skeptic wants to hold every ancient document that's ever been produced and then I have a really different set of rules. I remember when I was a kid, I had their house, all the rules to all the board games as soon as they started losing. Yeah, I did that very well. Whatever, Nate. I think we should do it with love and with kindness, obviously. Who made the rules and why are they so different? Something that we consider. You know, when we, when we begin to talk about this idea, is Jesus the Son of God? And, and certainly we need to be able to make logical arguments but sooner or later we've got to get back in that book sooner or later this is where we've got to go and if we're going to go here then we have to straight it's do we have reliable testimony about Jesus do we have reliable testimony about what he did and what he said and is that testimony that we should draw certain conclusions and I'm going to argue with at least three questions place to start number one do we have what they wrote do we have reason to believe that, that the New Testament is actually what was written by the authors or is it the product of some Catholic conspiracy or some Dan Brown movie and I think we all understand the truth of that is that no there was no Catholic conspiracy and yes we do have what they wrote as a matter of fact 
If we don't, if we dismiss the validity of Scripture, we in fact have to dismiss the validity of nearly every ancient, doc, ancient document that exists, including the documents we might use to try to disprove the Scripture. I won't get into all the facts and the figures, but Geisler and Nix in their introduction to the Bible talk about this. They say not only are there thousands more manuscripts and portions of the New Testament than other ancient books, but the oldest New Testament manuscript portions are centuries earlier. Consequently, consequently the original New Testament can be reconstructed with a greater degree of accuracy than those other ancient books. I appreciate someone who all said what this week, but a lot of people have said a lot of good things, and I'm going to steal it all. But uh, someone said this week that, that we can read about Jesus, and we can go to Tacitus and read about Jesus, and we can go to the Younger and read about Jesus, and yet those documents are not as well attested as the New Testament, the Gospels. And I think that's a powerful that we need to be willing and able to make when we're encountering the skeptic. But not only I, I think we talked about doubt yesterday. I think that's a powerful argument to help us and our brethren when, when we're confronting our doubts and being questioned about things. We certainly need to think about these things. John Wart Montgomery wrote, and this to be skeptical of the result that all of classical antiquity to slip into obscurity. For no documents of the ancient period are as well attested bibliographically, that's a big word, as the New Testament. And I think this is important. Again, upon what basis are we going to question the reliability of the New Testament? Why wouldn't we use that same basis, those same questions for other ancient documents? All I'm asking for of my skeptical friends is to treat the Bible with the same rules that they're going to treat Tacitus with, and Pliny the Younger with, and Josephus with. To simply treat them the same, ask the same questions, the same answers. I don't have one set of rules for your document, for mine. But we've talked about this fellow a little bit this week, haven't we? And, and I, I'm going to appeal to Bart Ehrman quite a bit in this lecture, and there, there's a reason. I, I don't know that he has the most... That, that's not why I'm quoting from him. I do know that he's very accessible. I do know that despite his credentials, he writes a lot of books, very popular. I'm going to cite from primarily in my lecture, How Jesus Became God. It, it's a difficult book to read. It's a lot of technical jargon. What he does use, he explains very well. It's very accessible. It makes him very dangerous. Uh, he lectures at, at, at a variety of college campuses. I think he kind of follows Ben Shapiro everywhere he seems to go. He talks to a lot of young people. talks to them on a very, a very popular I didn't mind as much as I hate to admit that. Somebody we need to listen to what he says. Was, do we have what they wrote and, and do we know who they are? And this quote speaks to that same question. He said, reasons for that none of these attributions, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the people we ascribe to writing the gospel. But he says there's good reason for thinking that none of these attributions, followers of Jesus, as we learn from the New Testament itself, were uneducated class Aramaic speaking Jews from Palestine. These books are not written by people like that. Their authors were highly educated groups of a later generation. They probably wrote after Jesus. They were writing in different parts of the world in a different language in a later time. Not much mystery about why later Christians would want to claim that the authors were in companions of Jesus connected with the apostles. That claim provided much need for these accounts for people wanting to know what Jesus was really like. And I think it's easy to read that and to look at all the initials. Uh oh, we got a and we would if, if that was true. Is that they lived in Palestine and they were Jews. Nonsense and a This idea that the apostles were illiterate, I'm not sure where that comes from. The big things that Aramon and those like him are going to miss the scriptures are what they call the tunnel period. It's between the written, I'm fine with that. It tells us about 30 years in there, and somehow this myth evolved in the 30 
years. Since none of these guys could write, it was a spoken myth, and so it could change and change rapidly. And they're dismissing a ton about the culture. They're acting like first century Jews had downloaded their brains onto phones like you and I had. They couldn't remember things like you and I can't remember them. It's a bunch of nonsense. Nonsense. If you look at this, let's just, let's just a second. I don't think it holds water. But let's just say for a second, you got a man like Peter, and he's a fisherman. By the way, he's a professional fisherman. He's running. You think he hadn't do, had, didn't have to do something? He didn't have to communicate with people on an intelligent level? I don't think that holds water. But let's just grant all of that. Let's just grant all of that. Let's just say there's a man like Peter who walks, sees what Jesus did, heard what Jesus did, who was told by Jesus that you're going to be with taking this out and sharing it with others, not even going to start for over 30 years. I don't know about you, but if I couldn't read, and some I believe the son I told me that's what I was going to do, I think I might spend the next 30 years learning how to read and write. And surely at some point in that 30 years, I'd figure it out. The idea that they didn't speak Greek, I think he is playing on us being Americans. We're probably the only people in the whole world that think it's odd to speak two languages. And yet they lived in a group world. Nothing in here makes when you actually stop and consider it. And what I found, I really frustrated when I was trying to read the opposition about these things. Look, I'm not a highly educated guy. The last, the last educational course I actually completed was right down the road at Lauderdale County High School. And this guy got more initials after his name. I've got hours in college. And it's not hard to see through this. It's not hard to see for just a minute and say, wait a minute, does that even make sense. And what I found out over and over as I was reading Bart Ehrman and others is, not really. Not really, not unless that's what we want. Something else he talks about is, is these people that were chosen. And he tells us that the people that wrote the Gospels were centuries later and they picked names that were connected to Jesus. If Matthew wasn't written in bold letters on the first page of the New Testament, and his name wasn't recorded in the list in Matthew 10. Would you even know who he was? I mean, of all the apostles, he's not a jump out to as being a key figure. Why choose, choose Mark? What's Mark known for other than writing the gospel? Abandoning Paul and Barnabas and leading them to have a, a disagreement that caused them to split up. Why, why pick that name? Why choose the names that were chosen if what you're trying to do is sort of instant credibility. These aren't the names that do that for you. Why isn't there the Gospel of James? Or, or, or why doesn't John write more? Why these names? It doesn't make sense. And by the way, there's these undying coincidences that make a lot of what he's saying here about, about men centuries later writing this nearly impossible. Nearly impossible. Think what John the Baptist says about Jesus. When Jesus comes to his baptism, John 1, 15, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. You know, if all John the Baptist says in chapter 1, I think what we would conclude is, he says there, Jesus is older than John. Right? I've got a younger brother. I existed before him. That's not that hard. Why do we know? Because I can go over to Luke chapter 1 and I can find out that J John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. And so he's not saying Jesus is older than him. He's saying something entirely different. And for just a, a ton one says something and, and you get more information from another author and it, and it weaves together perfectly. We can understand the whole. Brother, if this is written by men scattered over 300 years, geographically separated in a time where, where, where cross-country communication was almost impossible, how does that happen? How does that happen? The very words of the text tell me that can't be true. That can't be true. No, they are. I don't think there's any that are ascribed to these books. Especially not to believe that it was someone 300 years later, 200 years later. Someone simply doesn't work. And then there's 
again. Even in the last half of the first century, already sorting, reading, circulating, collecting of apostolic literature. It's kind of hard to understand how that happens if it hadn't been written yet. And yet that, that's what we know was, was taking place. With, with a great degree of accuracy. Is their testimony consistent? This is the next thing we're told. There's all these contradictions in the Bible. I haven't used the phrase yet, so I'm going to ha- go ahead and use it. In the, I, I talk about this idea of contradiction. Most of what's presented as a contradiction doesn't fit the definition of contradiction. It just doesn't. If there is, if there is a possible solution to an apparent contradiction, it's not a contradiction. And by the way, if, if some skeptic, if you're listening to a podcast or somebody approaches you and, and they list a contradiction in the Bible, let me tell you something, it won't be new. As a matter of fact, they, they've been argued for about 600 years now and they've been answered for about 600 years now. They don't have anything new. There's no reason to be taken back by that. They've been given their answer, they just, just don't like it. Well, sorry. Sorry. Is there testimony? Yes. It's consistent. It's historically consistent. Historians and archaeologists used to read Acts and talk about the fact that he had no idea what he was talking about. Place names were wrong and wrong. Now it's person names. And now Acts in Luke's work in the book of Acts is held up for its accuracy. Those things. And think about it. Luke could not jump on what was the name of the town 200 years ago? He had to know. He had to know. It's archaeologically consistent. It's historically in the book. And it, these contradictions that we're always hearing about, they simply are not there. And we need to understand that. Going back to that. I had someone complaining to me not too long ago about the, the healing of the blind man in Jericho. One gospel says there was one, and one gospel says there were two. Well, I mean the gospel. You can read a gospel that only mentions one, but does that follow that there's only one? Or could it be that one writer emphasizes the more vocal person and the other writer emphasizes the broader context so that we can see the power of Jesus? That's not a contradiction. The book is logically consistent we need to move on let's talk about the character of the witnesses why should we to them because they suffer their testimony the skeptics have to that but it's not a very good answer they're going to answer that and they're going to say but sean i mean there are people today there are buddhist monks today who will light themselves on fire as a testimony to their religion and their way of thinking there are muslims Day who will strap explosives on their bodies and go into a crowd in the name of God. Suffering doesn't mean they're right. Do you think they're right? No, I don't think they're right. I also don't think they're doing what the apostles did. I don't think they're doing what the apostles did. Anyone who martyrs themselves today in the name of a religion does so purely on the basis of what they were convinced of. Let me say that again. They do it on the basis of what they were convinced of. Someone else had to convince them in the example of the Muslim, someone else had to convince them that Allah is God and this is what he wants of you. That is not true of the apostles. The apostles didn't have someone else tell them Jesus was raised from the dead. They saw him. They were first-hand witnesses of the resurrection. Gary Habermas talks about this. He says, extreme acts do not validate the truth of their beliefs, but willingness to die indicates they regarded their beliefs as true. Moreover, there's an important difference between, between the apostle martyrs and those who die for their beliefs today. Modern martyrs, others have taught them, the according to their own testimony, that they had personally seen the risen Jesus. Now think about it. You've got 12 men. We're going to talk about 12 of them. You've got 12 men who know Jesus was raised from the dead, or they know he wasn't. If it was a hoax, no one knew it better than Peter, James, and John. Let me ask you, if you're one of the 12 that kills James, what do you do? I know what I'm doing. 
If I knew it was a hoax and I'm part of the hoax and James is put to death for the hoax, I'm calling the other guys together. Hey, guys. <laughs> I'm not even sure why we did this, but I'm done. I'm out. Not a one of them are can. It took, what, 48 hours for Nixon's conspiracy to fall apart when the feds started getting on to them and they started suffering a little bit. And John's going to preach the resurrection until nearly the second century. It just doesn't work, does it? It just doesn't work. I have a motive to lie. A podcast about this. And man, he made, a, he made a powerful point. He said every conspiracy in history has one of three motives. It's either power, money, or sex. Every conspiracy in, in, in history has been motivated by one of those. Which one of those work possible? The airmen and some we're going to say, well, they were, they were power hungry. What power? What power? You talk about an anachronism. They, they became leaders in an isolated group of people. They were outcast in every city and persecuted everywhere they went. Boy, give me that power. I understand. They developed great power bases, but it's not because they were teaching the truth of the gospel. It certainly wasn't the case of the apostles. Think about the that for a moment. Think about Saul of Tarsus. Someone this week said that he was he was the Pharisees. He was on track to replace Gamaliel. It's kind of their leading thought person. He had power. In all likelihood, being a Pharisee, he was rich. You know what happens in Acts chapter nine when he stands up after after he sees Jesus and he proclaims Jesus for the first time. You know what happens, right? Right then, right there, that moment. He gave it all up. He describes that in Philippians chapter 3. In great he had, he let go of. To do what? To suffer. The only money you really hear about the apostles with is the money that Paul carries from the Gentile church to the Jewish churches. He didn't benefit financially from her motivation sex is even to think about, isn't it? Sexual purity. Paul taught voluntary celibacy. None of it fits. Then there's the proximity and time and location. Think about in the book of Acts, when the apostles first began preaching the resurrection in Jerusalem two months after the crucifixion. If lying, why didn't somebody say, guys, he's right over there? Here's the tomb. How, um, um, it says, well, they couldn't take him to the tomb. They didn't bury crucifixion victims. So we found, say we, archaeologists have found crucifixion victims in tombs. Okay, they threw him in a ditch. You're telling me they couldn't find the soldier that did that? To take him over there and say he's laying right over there? The proximity in both time and location in which the apostles began preaching. The deception, if it was the impossible and say it I've been whittling my outline down all morning I didn't those who would tell us that the gospels are not reliable that really not reliable, especially rid of the statements of Jesus. Ehrman makes this argument that if Jesus was truly the Son of God, surely he would have said it. The first time I heard that, I thought, has he not read the book of John? Oh, he's read it. He found a way to get rid of it. And the way he gets rid of it is, is by these, these he uses to assess the statements of Jesus. It's very similar to the used by the Jesus Seminar in the early 90s, which was roundly rejected by Independent test day. In other words, if it's if if there's a saying of Jesus, gospel, maybe that's the case. It doesn't follow. But if it's only in one gospel, it must be false. There's quite a the lot. He talks about similarity. The idea being that if 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 Jesus in the 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 third century, if it's too similar, it can't be true, because they 
Jesus? It, it makes no sense. to be the one he writes. Jesus, Jewish, the things that he's attributed with saying that don't fit Jewish culture should be dismissed as not true. As if he's not a revolution. Of course what Jesus says is different. What well, you think about these things but here's what they they get rid of the gospel of John they just tell us none of those things are true right all those damn statements in John they're not in another one Matthew didn't write it and John write it so it's, it's gone according to them they get rid of most of the parables including and I think this is important that tenets that's in all three and his self In appeal to these passages, we lose most of what Jesus himself said about his own deeds. I'm not saying we have to have Jesus saying he's the Son in order for the Gospels to to that. But I am saying that it sure is helpful. Airmen will tell us Jesus came to be viewed fine over time. In other words, three people they decided, hey, he must have been. First two chapters of his book, How Jesus Became God, that. Trying to demonstrate from, from Roman culture and Roman practices that this was something common. And then trying to show, I think, very unsuccessfully that it was done in Jewish culture as well. It doesn't fit what we actually see. There is no evolution of thought from Mark to the 400s. Now, there are certainly some people that take different views. But there is a consistent thread of thought that Jesus is the divine Son of God the way through with him today. So what did the church believe? Well, let's just accept for a moment that Jesus never really says, I am the Son of God in the synoptics. He does something interesting throughout all three of the synoptics that, that I, I think are very powerful when you actually stop and think about them. And it's these I have come statements. Think about Mark 2, 17. Hearing this, Jesus said to them, I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. Luke 12, 49. I have come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. And the point I would make about this is when you read these verses in their context, it's obvious Jesus is not saying that I came from this city to that city. That what Jesus is saying is that He came from somewhere else. He's alluding to His pre-existence. He's alluding to the fact that He existed in a different realm. And He's come here. He's come to earth. He came in the time He came to do the will of His Father. The synoptics are littered with references to the pre-existence of Christ. Think about the parable of the talents. Turn over with me if you will. Let's just take Mark's, Mark's version of this. I think this is such a powerful, powerful example. And I think this is why men like Ehrman and, and the Jesus Seminar, they really want to get it out. They don't want it in there because it's in all three Gospels. Interestingly, this account is put in the same place in the life of Jesus in all three Gospels, and the context around the parable is the same in all three Gospels. That doesn't happen a lot. And so we're here at the end of, of Jesus' earthly ministry. We're not far before His crucifixion. He's come to Jerusalem. And you might go back and you might read in chapter 11, he, there's the triumphal entry, and He comes in and He goes straight to the temple, and He walks in, and then He, he doesn't say a word. He turns around and walks out and goes to Bethany. What's he doing? 
The Son of God came into the temple of God and He turns back on it. What was happening in that temple was not pleasing to God. And He walked away and the Jewish leaders became incensed, didn't they? And they began challenging Him in different ways. They asked Him, by what authority do you do these things? That didn't work out too well for Him. Jesus comes back and He begins to talk to them about this parable, John chapter 12, and there in verse 1, a man planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a vat under the wine press and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. You know the story as well as I do. He rented it out. The tenants were supposed to, to give him their due at the appropriate time. They refused to do it. He sends messengers. They beat them. They kill them. He finally says, I'll send my son. And they beat him and killed him too. Verse 1 is an allusion or actually a quotation from Isaiah chapter 5. You go back to Isaiah chapter 5. You read Isaiah's version of this. It becomes obvious what's going on. The landowner is God. God the Father. Who does that make His Son other than the Son of God? The Jews themselves understood the point of the parable. Jesus doesn't explain it. He asked them, what do you think this means? And they knew. This is testimony to the fact that Jesus believed Himself to be the very Son of God. Jesus believed Himself to be divine. Let me back up. I need to deal with this real quick. Other things we see. Throughout the synoptics, Jesus does what only God can do. He accepts worship. He forgives sins. We see this in all three synoptics. You know, Matthew 28, and there in verse 19, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He says, all authority has been given to Me. He's calling Himself the Son there. That is essentially the same thing that he does in John chapter 5 and verse 17 when he says, my father was working until now and now I work. And the Jews understood that. They weren't confused about it. They were going to kill him for blasphemy because he made himself equal to God, verse 18 says. That's exactly what Matthew 28, 19 does. Does Jesus say, my name is Jesus of Nazareth and I am the divine son of God in Matthew 28? Perhaps not that explicitly, but it's not far from it. It's not far from it. Of course, the parable we just looked at. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2. I find myself going back to this passage so often. Not only as I think about Jesus, but as I think about my own faith, and I think about what it is to serve God, and as I think about who God is, and what we need to know about God. I think this is a powerful passage, by the way, in this argument. Because men like Bart Ehrman will tell you, and this may be true, I don't know, but they'll tell you that verses 6 through 11 are a quotation of a poem that had existed throughout that tunnel period. That Paul's using that poem to, to express a truth about Jesus. I don't have a problem with that. I don't know if it's true or not. But that's what these scholars, these skeptical scholars, are going to tell us. Now, Bart Ehrman's also going to tell you that Paul believed that Jesus was an angel. And that's why Paul talks about Jesus in language that, that allows for pre-existence. He says he doesn't believe he was God. He believes he was an angel. He gets that from Galatians 4.14. And it's this highly technical grammatical argument that doesn't work. Because Paul tells me what he thinks about Jesus in Philippians 2, and he does it in fairly clear language. Notice this, verse 5, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He found an appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Just notice on the surface what it says. He existed before He was made in the likeness of man. You can't get around that in Philippians chapter 2. He existed before He was made in the likeness of man. His existence, Paul says, was in the form of God. He possessed the divine nature. Paul's not talking about an angel here. I'll show you in just a moment. He can't be. But not only that, he says He's equal to God. Airmen will talk about these second-class gods, that men are elevated to second-class godhood all, all over the place in antiquity. That's not what Paul describes here. This isn't some Roman mythology that Paul is appealing to. There's a couple of very important words that are, I think, very difficult to define. I, I think Vincent does about as good a job of that word form as you can do. He says the word is intended to describe that mode in which the essential being of God expresses itself. Listen to this. It's not identical with but it is identified with it as its natural and appropriate expression answering to it in every particular. Only God can have the form of God. 
He's talking about those things that are unique to God. Now, it's not his essence, it's not his nature. I believe this to be the thing that he empties himself of so that he can come in the form of a bondservant. Brother, you can't be the form of God if you're an angel. No man born of man and woman has ever been in the form of God. Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus of Nazareth alone have walked this earth who has ever existed in the form of God. The next word is grasped. I misunderstood this word for a long, long time. I kind of took it to mean clutched it, and certainly it can mean that. But Strong's defines it as the act of seizing, robbery, a thing seized or to be seized, clutched it. Anything deemed a prize. Look at the very last part. Anything to be held fast or retained. Which one of those definitions fits this context? This context talks about one who is God, who dwelt in the glories of heaven, who was, who was in unapproachable light, who had immortality, who had all the, the benefits, prerogatives, and privileges that are part of being God. He didn't think it robbery to be considered equal with God. But he didn't think it a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. There's something described here in this passage that Jesus was willing to let go of so that He could come and be like us. So that He could endure what you and I endure. So He could be tempted like you and I are tempted. So that He could die like a man dies. So that He could defeat death. So that you and I could have that victory. This passage describes some things that are so important and so powerful. First of all, it describes a change, a condensation or condescension from the fully expressed unlimited glory and privilege of God to the limits of humanity. Oh, what He gave up to be like us. What a sacrifice He underwent. The pre-existence of Jesus, and I'm using the word Jesus somewhat accommodatively. We're talking about the pre-incarnate word there in verse 7. Fundamental to the argument is the pre-existence of Jesus and His participation in the full nature of God. Brother, if that's not what's going on in Philippians 2, then you and I don't have the salvation from our sins. Because if God didn't die on a cross, we're lost. If God didn't die on that cross, we're condemned. I got four more passages. You've got to read about them in the book. There's something else I've struggled with in my life in this passage, and, and I've been preaching about this a lot. I've been talking about this a lot. I think what I'm learning in Philippians 2 has helped me with, with my daily faith and with, with just things that happen in life. And, and I think it's helpful to others. And that has to do with the submission that Christ demonstrates in this passage. For a long time, what I thought was that Jesus had to become like a man to learn how to be submissive, to learn how to submit to the Father. And, and there's certainly a distinction to be made between what Jesus demonstrated before the incarnation and the level of submission you see in the flesh and going to the cross. Certainly there's a distinction to be made. But something this passage has helped me to understand is that submission is an intrinsic part of the nature of God. When do we begin reading about Jesus submitting in Philippians chapter 2? I know we want to run down to verse 8 and we want to go talk about that cross. But brethren, it was the pre-incarnate Word who condescended and came here. And Jesus talks about this in other places. You might place a marker there in Philippians 2 and turn with me over to John chapter 6. Jesus says this in John chapter 6. While you're turning, think about 1 Peter 1. How the Father before the foundation of the world predetermined, right? He chose that the blood of Jesus Christ would be the redemptive price. That's not something God came up with after Adam and Eve's sin. That was the plan to redeem mankind from before sin occurred. The pre-incarnate Word submitted to that plan. The God who is Jesus submitted to that plan. Before He came in the flesh, John chapter 6, He talks about this for us. Notice verse 38. He says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. The unlimited God, Jesus Himself, the Word, put Himself under another. It was the Father. 
Somebody says, why is that so important? It's one of the reasons this, this concept that Jesus is the Son of God is so powerful. We talked about suffering and doubt yesterday. If you take your Bible and just let it fall open, the page it opens to, what you're going to find out is that those who believe in God are going to serve, they're going to suffer, and they're going to sacrifice. And I think one of the great questions that we have is we try to navigate this life and be faithful to God is why? And I know in my life there have been times where I've kind of looked at God and said, well, God, it's easy for you to say. And maybe I kind of looked at Jesus and I thought, well, there was this aberration here, this 33-year period where Jesus kind of stepped into our role and, and maybe, maybe found out what it meant to submit. Undoubtedly, he learned about pain and, and, and some other things. I, I understand that. But this concept of submission. Right? It wasn't an aberration in the life of Jesus. It's intrinsic to the nature of God. What are we trying to do as Christians? Peter talks about partaking in the divine nature. Not that we become God, but that we become more like Him. What do we do when we serve, when we sacrifice, and we suffer? We emulate the very nature of the God who loves us. The God who sent His Son to die on a cross so that our sins could be atoned for the God that raised his son from the grave so that you and I could know and could experience that power so that we could have eternal life. I appreciate your attention so much. Thank you, Sean. Our Lord's question that's posed in Matthew chapter 16, who do men say that I am, and Peter's answer in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, could summarize the lecture that we've just heard. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thank you so much, Sean. Let's take just a few moments.
We have just about a minute. Yes. We need to go ahead and get seated, please. All right, it is time for us to get started with this next lecture. If you will, please come on to your seats. I want to mention a couple of books real quick while you're coming back to your seats. Uh, I mentioned this one yesterday uh, following Mike Willis's lecture, but I want to mention it again. This is a brand new book, My Living Sacrifice uh, by Mike, that is uh, covering Romans 12 and 13. And we have those in the foyer. Please take a look. Again, that's brand new. One that we've had for a number of years that uh, uh, it's easy to forget about if you don't watch out is Jesus, the Bread of Life. And this is a four-quarter study on the life of Jesus. Uh, and, you know, this is obviously going to be top of mind following these lectures. Uh, if you wanted to go back to your home congregation and work through a four-quarter study uh, and, and you want something that's not quite as technical as the lectures, if you will, but just a, an overview, complete study, this would be uh, something I would highly recommend. These are also in the foyer. You could take a closer look at them uh, if you get a chance as well. Uh, Mark will come now and introduce our next speaker. Brother Kevin Maxey and his wife Jennifer, dear friends of many of us, they have five children and they have labored since 2009 at the Port Royal Congregation uh, near Spring Hill, Tennessee. And of course, Kevin has preached in other places as well, Oregon, Florida, Texas, Arkansas, Germany, and made a number of trips overseas to preach the gospel in foreign lands. Uh, he has considerable accomplishments in the academic realm and was recently granted his doctorate, doctorate at, uh, at Lipscomb University. And yet he hasn't lost the common touch and he certainly has maintained his faith and conviction and dedication to God through all of that. He and his wife are gifted writers and so we have benefited from uh, the good articles he submitted uh, to Truth Magazine and the previous participation he's had in different ways and her writing also is is uh, appreciated by our sisters uh, in, in Bible classes and ladies' classes. Uh, Kevin has served as an advisor and now is a, is a full board member to Truth Publications, and he missed the last meeting. And so we just assigned him all the hard things that have to be done. And the one task he doesn't know about, but I would love to hand off to him, is there are 11,000 individual web pages on truthmagazine.com scanned in, and some of them have errors and Kevin, you can handle that, can't you? <laughs> no, we are, we are delighted to have his involvement in this organization as we seek to produce good Bible literature. And he brings a lot to both the podium this morning but, and, and the subject at hand in particular, uh, but our collective efforts as well. As well. You know, this article and, and the lecture that you're about to hear is one that is rich on a number of levels. First of all, uh, it, it is rooted in a respect for Scripture and accurately communicating God's will on this particular subject of, I believe, Jesus and the impact he has upon us today. But, but it is also connected with the, the notion of, of how that impacts us as we go through the stages of life that can sometimes be traumatic. You know, in editing a manuscript, that's often a, a sort of a technical and tedious process of making sure grammatically things are correct and stylistically things meet our style guide. This manuscript moved me to tears because of the experience that he describes and that you will note as he communicates to you this morning. And so, Kevin, come speak to us. When my oldest daughter was little, she loved swinging in the backyard. And one of my favorite memories is pushing her on the swing and hearing her shout with every ounce of enthusiasm that her little three-year-old body could muster. She would shout, push me high up in the sky, Da. I believe that's a great description of what our role is as parents to push our children skyward, to inspire them to dream, to equip them for those dreams, and to, to support them as they chase those dreams, to pick them up when they fall, and to help them fly Godward and heavenward. 
Jessica was our oldest child, and so she didn't have older siblings to play with, and so some of her younger years were lonely. And I remember one afternoon hearing her shout in the backyard, shouting, and so I ran to the back to see what she was shouting about. And she was looking up, she was on her swing, and she was looking up in the sky saying, Jesus, come play with me. And so in her little three-year-old mind, we had told her that Jesus was coming in the clouds. And so that's where she thought Jesus was. And she wanted Jesus to be her friend. I love this childlike faith. And it's a childlike faith that we all should have. And I believe it's a great description of our desire for the divine presence and our desire to be in Christ's presence. Is this just a cute little children's story, or is it something that tells us that we crave a relationship with Jesus that we are missing? My topic this morning is, I believe that Jesus is with believers always. And so I want to ask you four questions. First question is, do you believe in Jesus? Well, that obviously is an easy question to answer at the end of an intensive week-long lectureship dealing with apologetics about the life of Jesus. And so you would say yes. But I want to get a little bit more direct. Do you believe that Jesus is with believers? And as you look at this theological question, you would say, well, yes, I believe Jesus is with believers. I want to get more personal. Do you believe that Jesus is with you? This past week, the Alpha and the Omega, the King of Kings, was he with you? Was he with you, the great I am, the risen Savior of the world? And if he is with you, how is he with you? And how is that presence manifested? And let me get a little bit more specific. Do you believe that Jesus is with you always? Be honest. Think back to harsh times of failure and bitter disappointment. Was Jesus, our risen Lord, with you then? What about times of vulnerable weakness or when you're facing what seems to be impossible temptation? Was Jesus, the eternal potentate, with you then? And what about times of crushing trial and exhausting hardship? Is Jesus with you always? A time of crushing trial hit our family on January 11th of this past year. It was a Tuesday afternoon, 229. We received a phone call from an off-duty paramedic named Kenny, who was driving just a few cars behind my daughter, and he witnessed her get struck from behind on I-75 in Florida, Tampa, by a car that was going 100 miles an hour, and she flipped, she was in the passenger side, she flipped eight times, he said, over three lanes of traffic, and landed over in the median. So Kenny had just pulled my daughter out of the car, she was hanging upside down, and he put her on the phone, and I heard her say, My foot hurts, there's a lot of blood. Matt, her boyfriend, was still in the car. She said, they can't get him out. I can hear Matt screaming, and I could hear Matt screaming on the other end of the phone. She said, I smell gas. I don't know what we're going to do. Feeling very inadequate, Jennifer and I, tried to reassure her to stay strong, that we love her, and that we're on our way. And so the only problem was, is we were 718 miles away in Tennessee. So we paced around the house, we prayed, we panicked, we threw some clothes in a bag, we got in the car, and we drove through the night. The longest night of our life, because we didn't know if our daughter or Matt, we're going to live or die. During moments like that, during crushing trials 
and catastrophe, Satan tempts us to question the presence of God. And I'm confident that we go around the room and every one of you could share similar stories of tragedy, hardship, suffering. And we ask the question, where is God during those times? Atheist Sam Harris claims that events like this prove that God doesn't exist. And he very brashly states, either God can do nothing to stop catastrophes like this, or he doesn't care to, or he doesn't exist. God is either impotent, evil, or imaginary. Even his denial of God is an admission that man has been searching for divine presence from the beginning of time. Whether you admit it or not, man, humanity, has been running to or running away from God ever since the beginning. And Adam, in the beginning, was hiding from God. Pre-flood humanity ignored God. Angry Jonah ran away from God. Even King David in Psalm 13, as he pours out his, his heart to God, said, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? We learn that catastrophic presence does not negate divine presence. And you see that in Psalm 23, where we know that God is our shepherd. Jesus is our shepherd who is present with us in the still waters and by the green pastures. But also, David writes about his confidence that God is present, that we will fear no evil because he is with us in the presence of our enemies. And even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is present even in times of catastrophe. And so my family's experience, even in the terror of that car accident, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, I want to affirm to you that we learned that God is present. And the main text that we're going to look at for our study is the Great Commission passage. So if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28 and verses 16 through 20, we find three reasons why I believe that Jesus is with believers always. Because this text tells us it's a promised presence, it's a proven presence, and it's an empowering presence. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, and let's revisit this familiar passage, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold... I am with you always to the end of the age. So this text tells us these three points, that Jesus has promised his presence, his presence is proven, and his presence is empowering. As we look at this Great Commission passage, we rightly so describe this at the great, as the Great Commission. However, do you understand that there is a great promise that follows the Great Commission? that the Bible gives us this instruction that Jesus is sending out his apostles to go out and to carry on this mission, and he doesn't send them alone. He gives them this great promise, and he tells them that he would be with them. I am with you always. Notice that he says, and he draws attention to this promise by using the word behold. You know, we don't use that word often, but if Lance were to run in here and make a statement and say, look here, we would give him our full attention. This is an exclamatory statement that Jesus is wanting to give us, get our attention. Five times, in fact, in Matthew 28, we see the word behold or look. And it's made to get our attention in chapter 28 and verse 2. Behold, there was an earthquake. Chapter 28 and verse 7, Jesus is risen. Behold, 
Verse 9, behold, he is risen. Verse 11, behold, the guards report that Jesus is risen. And behold, I am with you always. We listen to other promises of Jesus, but are you listening to this promise? That he says that he will be with us? He's demanding our attention. How often have you grabbed your child? Maybe they're in danger and they're scared and they're panicked and you say, look at me. I want your attention. You will be okay. And this is what Jesus is doing. This is a promise that is noteworthy. It is a promise that is mission defining. And it is a promise that is action empowering. Jesus is saying, focus on me. And I believe he's saying, focus on me to three different groups of people for three different reasons. Could you imagine if you were the apostles? They've just seen their savior be beaten and slaughtered and crucified. And finally, they now see that he's risen. And then suddenly, their risen Lord is leaving them. And so he's telling them, though my bodily presence is about to depart, my divine presence would remain. The apostles urgently needed to understand that there was a difference between the bodily manifestation of Jesus' presence and his spiritual manifestation, his divine presence. They needed to hear as they were shook to the core about all the things that had happened that they had a job to do and Jesus was saying that he was going to be with them. The apostles need to hear this message. The original readers in the the Gospel of Matthew needed to hear this message. So remember that Matthew is compiling all of these accounts. He's inspired, and he's writing it what appears to be to a Jewish audience who could have been filled with either Christian, Jewish Christians that were saying, well, it's been some time now since Jesus has, has returned. Where is he? They needed to hear about his presence. Or maybe it was Jews that needed to be converted to Christ, and they're saying, well, he's gone. They need to hear that Jesus is present. And that's a theme that runs through the Gospel of Matthew. We read in Matthew 1, in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of Matthew, there is this theme that God or Christ is present. Matthew 1.23, Jesus is called Emmanuel, God with us. Right at the beginning of the book is an emphasis on the presence of Jesus. In the middle of the book, in Matthew 18 and verse 20, Matthew promises that Jesus would be present whether two or three are gathered in my name. There I am in the midst of them. I will be present. And then here at the conclusion in Matthew 28, 20, the last words that Matthew records that he wants his listeners to hear, the last words of his gospel is, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The apostles needed to hear it. The audience in the first century that read the book of Matthew needed to hear it, and we today, as modern disciples, need to hear it. And if you were to ask me this question, do you believe that Jesus is with believers always? If you had asked me this question about a year ago, I probably would have struggled with how to answer that question. And just to be honest, I think about my relationship with the Father, and I feel like I talk to the Father in prayer, Uh, all the time, and I I, I can feel his presence. I know that the Bible talks about how Jesus ascended and he went to heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit dwells in us and we understand that role. We also understand that God has angels who are ministering spirits sent to minister to those who inherit salvation. So we can understand. I can understand about the Holy Spirit and I understand about angels and I understand about the Father. But when I think about Jesus, often personally in my life, I have sort of relegated Jesus that he's he's gone and he's at the throne. And I don't really think about what he does today and how he interacts and that he is really present with me. When I talk to Jessica as I was completing this lecture after the accident, I was asking her about this and talking about some of the things I've been studying. And I said, well, which member of the Godhead do you most comfortably feel that you relate to? And she said it was Jesus because he came in the flesh to be like us and to walk in our steps. And that makes sense. And, and perhaps she's kept her childlike faith. And I have missed that in the sense of not seeing and hearing this promise That God tells us that Jesus, that Jesus himself promises that he would be with us. And when we look at this and you say, well, how how is he with us? In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, we 
we need to have the faith that Paul had. In Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I, like Paul, believe Christ lives in me. Do you believe? Paul knew that Jesus was with him. Paul said, I live by faith. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, and the scriptures hold the answer. So it's, it's one thing to say it's a promised presence. And you say, okay, well, it's, Jesus promised it, but how do we know that it's true? If you go back to our text, go back to our text in Matthew chapter 28. I had never noticed this before, and I think because I just key in on the Great Commission charge, but you, if you might have picked up on it when we read the text, in Matthew 28, the 11 disciples, in verse 16, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Have you ever noticed that before? So, if, if, so Matthew was present, and Matthew is recording this, I don't know, if, if I were to give details of my family history, I, I wouldn't want to detail instances of doubt or things that would be embarrassing. W what is it here that why would the apostles, why would some be doubting? And I don't think they're doubting that Jesus is the Son of God. They've witnessed his miracles. They've just experienced his earth-shattering resurrection. They're not doubting who he is, but I think they're doubting that he's about ready to leave them. Like, wait a minute. Everything we've been working for, they were excited about the kingdom coming, and now you're leaving us? And they're doubting. And so I, I put up four reasons why I think that they were doubting. One is, and I think if we look at these, it will help us understand why we may doubt the presence of Jesus in our lives because of the same four reasons. One is they had unfulfilled expectations. In Acts chapter 1, remember when they saw Jesus, they said, is now the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They had a different expectation of what the kingdom was going to be like, and so that wasn't happening, and so they're doubting. Wait a minute, this plan is not the way that we planned it in our mind. They also were perhaps feeling abandoned, Try to imagine this overwhelming feeling of someone you love coming back from the dead. You know, my, my father passed away this last year, and my mom and my brother, and I, you know, we've all had dreams that we've talked to our dad, to, to, to my dad, and you just think, what, what would that be like to have a loved one come back to life? You wouldn't want to let him go. And so Jesus actually comes back to life, and then now, wait a minute, you're going to leave us? They could be feeling abandoned. What are we going to do without you? They could be feeling inadequate. So this mission of establishing the kingdom and spreading the gospel to all nations, you're wanting us to do that without you? How are we fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, how are we Galileans supposed to carry out this gospel to the ends of the earth? feeling inadequate, feeling abandoned, unfulfilled expectations, and formidable opposition finally would create doubt. Some 50 days prior, Jesus, remember, was brutally tortured, slaughtered. And you're wanting us to go into that same town and preach the gospel. What's going to happen to us? So even if the apostles had problems with doubt, uh, then we need to understand, well, so, so it's, it's common that we too would struggle with doubt. So do you doubt the presence of Jesus? I think of that, those, those words, and some doubted. You know, we worship every first day of the week, and we are encouraged by being with our brethren, and we come around the throne of God, but then we go home, and some doubt. We return to heavy burdens. Or we believe that God rules in the kingdoms of men, but then we turn on the news, or we scroll through our phone feed, and we see what's happening in the world, and it looks like Satan is winning, and some doubt. We see what's happening in Russia, the Ukraine, Afghanistan, and even in Washington, and some doubt. We read another story of riots and protests and school shootings, and some doubt. 
so much evil, or we get excited about evangelism, and we face rejection and apathy, and then we, we doubt the ability to carry out the Great Commission. We believe in life after death, but then another loved one dies, and we find ourselves at the, at the cemetery burying another loved one, and we doubt. Unfulfilled expectations, feeling abandoned, feeling inadequate, and formidable opposition can create doubt. Well, what I want to affirm to you is that the presence of Jesus removes all of these doubts. And so let's look at the second point, and that is that Jesus is present because it is a proven presence. And many of these points have already been made during this lectureship. Jesus was present on the earth, and there's eyewitnesses. Not only do we have the writings of his followers and his disciples that were described just moments ago, but also of secular historians that describe that Jesus was present on the earth. So we won't spend time talking about that. Jesus was present prior to his incarnation. As we look at what, look at, if, if you were to write the story of Jesus and you have the four Gospels, where would you begin to tell the story of Jesus? Mark starts with John the Baptist and goes back to Isaiah in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Where does Matthew start when he says, okay, let me tell you the story of Jesus. I'm going to go all the way back to Abraham in Matthew chapter 1. Luke Where does Luke start as he wants to tell the story of Jesus? He goes all the way back to Adam in Luke chapter 3 and verse 38. And then John, where does he start? He goes all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning was the word. He goes even back farther prior to creation. Jesus is present now because he's always been present. And Jesus was present before creation. I love what Sean said just moments ago about how the the I have come statements emphasize that Jesus was pre-existent before he arrived on the earth, before he became flesh. John 1, 1 through 3, Jesus was in the beginning with God. John 17, 5, Jesus was glorified with the Father before the world was. John 17, 24, the Father loved Jesus before the foundation of the world. And so what does that tell us? That Jesus' presence is not limited to a a physical bodily manifestation because he was present and existent prior to his time in the flesh. And Jesus' presence is not limited to time and to creation. Jesus was present during the creation. Colossians 1 and verse 16, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, Whether thrones or power or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Jesus was present during creation. And so if he is the creator, then he is not limited to the laws of creation, the laws of nature, the laws of science. And so when we try to think of our our idea of how is Jesus present and we try to put him in physical laws, we don't need to look at it that way because Jesus' manifestation is not limited to those things. Jesus is also present during Old Testament history. It's when you read through the New Testament and then you come across amazing passages like Hebrews chapter 11, verses 25 to 26. And when we think about Jesus and his role, often simply just being in the New Testament, we find these passages that tell us that Jesus was present before creation, he was present at creation, and he was present all the way through the history of mankind, even in the Old Testament, that Moses living by faith, esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. How does all that work? I don't know, but there was a work of Christ, and Moses was involved in that, and that, that was, Christ was present in that story of Egypt. Also, Jude 4 through 5 speaks of this, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, speaking of their time in the wilderness, For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Jesus, though it's hard for us to understand, he was present with our Old Testament patriarchs. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10 through 11, Jesus was present in the spirit of the Old Testament prophets. 
And we read about the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Jesus was present in all of these cases. And then perhaps we can relate most of all to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44. Who Jesus has risen from the grave and he's walking with them and they don't even see him. And maybe... That's how I've been in my walk as a Christian for a long time, is I've thought that Jesus isn't with me. But as we read in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, Jesus was with them and he revealed himself to them. And then he says, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And so Jesus is saying all of Scripture is speaking of me. Jesus' presence was not limited to his death. And then even more powerfully, his presence was not limited to uh, prior to his ascension. When you go into the New Testament, we see example after example of the interaction of Jesus in humanity. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, so this would be a parallel to the Great Commission passage in Mark 16 and verse 20. Listen to what this passage says. Jesus has ascended already. His bodily presence is gone. But in Mark 16, 20, it says, They went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. How did he do that? The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. The Lord was present. So there he's fulfilling his promise that he told them, I'm going to send you out and I'm not going to abandon you. My divine presence will be with you. And he was with them as they spread the gospel. In Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, as Luke continues his account that he began in the gospel of Luke, he says that his account is of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And so that's implying for us that his account in Luke was just the beginning of the work of Jesus, that his work is not limited to the work that he accomplished in his bodily manifestation in the Gospels, but that he was still working through the book of Acts. And there are over 10 references in the book of Acts and in the epistles where we see Jesus present at Stephen's uh, execution in Acts chapter 7, in Paul's uh, vision on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, over and over again, Paul says that he saw the Lord, or the Lord stood by Paul. And then most telling of all, I believe, is in Revelation chapter 2 and in verse 1, where we see Jesus writing to the churches, the seven churches of Asia, and we see he's described as walking in the midst of the churches. Jesus is walking in our midst. He is fulfilling that promise. He has promised it, and he has proven it. So let's get to the, the application as we look at our third point and see that Jesus has promised that he would be with us. He's proven that he would be with us, that his presence is not limited to his bodily manifestation, but that it was prior and be even before creation all throughout Old Testament history. And then even after he ascended and it went on through the New Testament. What's the point this week you have heard exceptional lessons proclaiming various aspects about Jesus. That he lived, he performed miracles, that he was born of a virgin, that he rose again. But what's the point of it all if he's not present? There's a difference in saying Jesus rose and Jesus is risen. Do you, th though it's spectacular... Was the proof of the resurrection only significant in just the event itself? Or is it significant because of what it enables Christ to do through eternity? Jesus is risen so that he can reign on his throne, so that he can spread his gospel, so that he can empower his believers, so that he can be present with us. And we're going to go through some examples of how he does that. And so I thought, I think it's important for us to have not a past tense mentality about the resurrection, 
But to look at it as it's ongoing in the sense that Jesus is risen, that he is risen to reign, he's risen to rule, he's risen to be present with believers. You know, if you, what would be the point if, if uh, you had a loved one that came back to life, but then you couldn't, he, he wasn't active and he wasn't present and he wasn't with you anymore. What's the point of him being risen, right? You would want your loved one to be risen so that you could have relationship with him. Jesus is risen. And so he is risen to empower us. So if we go back to our text in Matthew chapter 28, this is fan- phenomenal. As I, as I look at this, I see first, pretend that there's just 11 of us here and that the church has not been established. And you have been given the task to take the gospel to the world. And this is your task. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Could you, could you imagine having to do that? It's challenging enough for us when we leave here to go to our hometowns, to face the opposition we face, to deal with apathy, to deal with discouragement, to face struggles. But imagine if there, there weren't any other churches. It was just 11 of us, and Jesus is saying to you, I want you to spread the church around the world. And so he's saying, make disciples of, what? of all the nations. And what does that include? It's this formidable task of reaching, transforming, and uniting self-righteous Jews, idolatrous Gentiles, immoral pagans, and the very ones who murdered the Son of God. Do you think you could do that? Can you make all of them united into one family? Can you make disciples of all nations and then to go? He's telling the apostles to go, which would involve intentional action, costly sacrifice, painful goodbyes, and unknown tomorrows. Are you ready to go? And then to baptize, to to take these idolatrous, pagan, immoral, self-righteous murderers and then convince them that they're to humbly submit to a water ritual of baptism as a demonstration of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? How are we going to convince people to do that? And then to teach them, not just a, a simple salvation message, but to teach them all that I've commanded you. This is an overwhelming task, but notice that Jesus has not abandoned his apostles and he's not abandoned us because in this, this charge, this charge to make disciples by going and by baptizing and by teaching is surrounded by two bedrock promises or two bedrock principles about who Jesus is. The um, omnipotence of Jesus and the omnipresence of Jesus. He says, I have all authority. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So there is no realm, no cave, no place on this earth where Jesus' authority is not present. There is no realm in the heavens and the spiritual places where Christ is not supreme. His omnipotence. He's saying, I'm going to send you out and I'm sending you out with my authority and my power. And not only that, but then he says, I'm going to be with you, his omnipotence and his omnipresence. Now, each one of those things are tremendous, but without the other, it would be insignificant. What if Jesus was all powerful, but then he wasn't with us? What good would that do for us? And what if Jesus was with us, but he wasn't all powerful? How would we accomplish this task? The point of this text is, as Jesus is saying, I am not abandoning you, but I'm giving you the power that you need. And I'm giving you my presence to help you carry out this mission. And that will remove the doubt. And we need to hear that You say, well, where, how did he do that? Well, Jesus went with them. We already read in Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, the parallel passage of this commission that he did the exact same thing that he just promised. They went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. So Jesus did what he said he was going to do. And so everything that he's telling them to do in this great commission, he was with them on. When they went, he was there. Was he not with Paul and Stephen? Was he not with the apostles? 
when they made disciples, he was there. When a, someone becomes a disciple through the sanctification process, Jesus is there. When they were baptized, he was there. As souls are baptized into the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection, when they taught others his commands, he is Logos, he is the word, he was there. Jesus did not enlist the apostles and then abandon them without power and without his presence. And Jesus does not enlist us to be his disciples and abandon us to say that, well, we can't teach the gospel. We see that Jesus exists, but what are we going to do at this lectureship if we don't go out and tell other people about it? And you say, well, I can't do it. We don't have the power. We have the power and we have his presence and we have his truth. So Jesus, how does he empower us? He empowers our walk. We read that we're to walk in the straight and narrow way. Jesus doesn't call us to follow after him and then say, good luck. You're on your own. Find your way to heaven. No, he, he came to the earth to walk the steps for us and that we walk in his footsteps. First Peter chapter two and verse 21. And so we have his example about how he interacted with his family, with how he interacted with sinners, how he interacted with the religious leaders, how he interacted with the enemies. How, how he interacted with Satan. All these are examples that he empowers us in our walk. So when we walk in his way, Jesus is present. Jesus not only equips our walk, he equips our prayers. Jesus doesn't say, okay, I want you to pray to the Father, but good luck getting your message to the Father and getting the Father to hear you. No, that's not what he does. He helps us with our prayers. We pray through his name, John 14, 13. So when we pray, he is present. He is our mediator and our intercessor, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 16. It's through his work as a high priest that we can boldly approach the throne of grace, Hebrews chapter 4, 15 through 16. You say, where is Jesus? When we walk, he's present. And when we pray, he's present. Jesus equips our repentance. He doesn't say, okay, stop sinning, but good luck, you're on your own. No, in 1 John 1, 7 through 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. Jesus is our advocate. When we repent, he helps us. Jesus is present. When we teach, Jesus is present. What are we teaching? Where do we get the message from? Jesus is the author. He is the message. He is the source. He's the motive. He's the glory. He's the authority of all that we teach. How can you say Jesus is not present? Jesus is, the, is present in our teaching. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, Paul said, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Is Jesus central in your message? When we teach, Jesus is present. When we worship, Jesus doesn't say, try to, I think we were studying just in our Wednesday night class about how the Jews, the Hebrews were terrified to come to Mount Sinai. And the thunder and the lightning, and God said to step back. Jesus now invites us to worship in the heavenly tabernacle, in the presence of God. And he doesn't say, well, try to figure out how to come on your own, in your own righteousness. No, he is our high priest, giving us confident access, Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. When we pray in our worship on Sundays, we pray when we observe the Lord's Supper, when we give for his work, when we teach his word, Jesus is present. Jesus is present in our suffering. I know you've talked about this a lot this week already, and you are no stranger here to suffering. But Jesus doesn't say, take up your cross and follow me, and when times get tough, you're on your own. No, he says, pick up my yoke. I will help you. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. The compassion of Jesus standing at the right hand of his father's throne when Stephen was being slaughtered, stones being hurled upon him one after the other. Does Jesus, is he present when we suffer? Do you see that picture? 
And then when Jesus approached Saul and came against him with charges of like, why are you persecuting me in Acts chapter 9 and verses 4 through 5? How are they persecuting Jesus? How is Paul persecuting Jesus? Jesus felt every blow, every insult. He was being persecuted when his church was being persecuted. When we suffer, Jesus is present. Jesus is present when we die. You are no stranger to the faces of death. David said in Psalm 23 and verse 4, You are with me, I fear no evil, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Paul found comfort in Philippians 1, how he said that I, I desired to depart and to be with Christ. When we face death, Jesus is present. And then finally, Jesus is present when we face our judgment. Jesus doesn't say, confess me before men, but when you get to the judgment, you're on your own. No, he says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. I will be your advocate. Jesus does not send us to the judgment unrepresented. So as we conclude, I want to make three closing points. Are you still not convinced? Where is Jesus' presence? You know, I possess an antique wooden sewing cabinet. And to most, it would be nothing of great value. It would not sell for much. But to me, it's priceless. The beauty that I see in the cabinet is rooted in the beauty of the cabinet maker. My grandfather made that cabinet. And so I, I have this, I cherish it because it represents to me his presence. And I'm sure you have handiwork, heirlooms that reflect the presence of your loved ones. Do you not see God? As the creator of all things, we see Christ in his creation. That's what Psalm 19 tells us. The heavens declare the glory of God. Last summer, we went on a trip with our family, went camping down at the Grand Canyon. We set our alarm, got up before dark so we could see the sunrise. And then we go and are huddled, and there, there must have been 100 people. And I don't know the faith of those that were huddled there, but you think, what, what are all these people doing getting up before dark to watch something that Christ has made? Jesus is saying, I'm right here. Don't you see me? So if you can't see Christ's presence, then you need to spend more time looking at his creation. Jesus paints his brilliant presence on the starry canvas of the universe. He carves his rugged resilience on the rocky mountaintops. He radiates his glorious creativity across the earthly landscape. And he shows his inexhaustible power sustaining all living things. If the presence of Jesus is absent in your life, stop. Open your eyes to his creation. Another way we see Jesus is in his words. I have a note that my daughter Jessica wrote that she gave me that I keep in my Bible um, just a few days after her car accident. And to other people, it's, it's not important. Its value is not in paper and ink, but its value lies in the words, precious words of a loved one. I keep it in my Bible as a reminder of my daughter's presence. I'm sure you have cards, letters from loved ones. Why do you keep them? Because they remind you of your loved one's presence. Jesus is present in his words. When I reread my daughter's letter, I hear her voice. If the presence of Jesus is absent in your life, spend more time in his word, and there you will hear his voice. And then finally, Jesus' presence we can see in his church. In the days that followed my daughter's accident, uh, we saw Christ's presence manifested in you, the family of God. When our family was falling, you caught us. The church, though we are not perfect, we need to stop attacking one another and we need to start seeing the love of Christ in the church. 
In Christians, we see Christ. In the kingdom, we see the king. In the sheep, we see the shepherd. In the branches, we see the vine. In the bride, we see the groom. In the body, we see the head. We need to see Christ in his church. And if the presence of Jesus is absent in your life, perhaps it's because you're detached from your brethren. And you need to see his family and to see him in his family. So I didn't tell you what happened after the the car accident. Praise the Lord that Matt and Jessica are alive and well. Matt, uh, unbelievably, thankfully to the Lord, uh, had no broken bones. His head was scalped. He went through three surgeries. And it was very traumatic with skin grafts on his his head. And he, he says today... That I'm thankful for these scars because it gives me an opportunity to tell other people about how God saved me. What a great testimony. And my daughter broke her ankle and had some other injuries, but she is doing well. And two days ago, uh, she knocked on my door. I was sick in bed, and she came to tell me goodbye. She and five of her girlfriends loaded up the van with camping gear, and they are headed out west. And so I hugged her. And part of me wanted to say, no, (laughs) no more road trips. You can't go. But I still heard that little three-year-old voice saying, push me high up into the sky, Dad. We have nothing to fear if we are safe in the arms of Jesus. And may we all live with that passion to serve God, to carry his gospel to the world. Our last question is not, does Jesus want to be with you? It shouldn't be, is Jesus present with his believers? We already know that. The question is, do you want to be present with him? That's the question. Are you seeking him? Because he's right there. He stands at the door and knocks. Will you open? Jesus gave the 12 their marching orders in the Great Commission. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That word always, unique combination of three Greek words, pas, ha, hemera, all the days, literally all the days, the good ones, the bad ones, the traumatic ones, the ones where we're weak, the ones where we're strong. What a powerful lesson that we've heard this morning. Lance. Just want to remind you of a couple of things. One, the ladies lecture here at 11 is in the lunchroom. It's down the ramp hallway here on the left, kind of directly behind this auditorium. Uh, So ladies, be sure you uh, make yourself comfortable there. Children's class will be in the library. Uh, It is where you came in in the foyer. It is down the hallway, uh, but through the double doors right there at the entrance. Uh, You can find your way uh, to the children's class there. I also wanted to remind you we have a catalog with our our particular publications in it. It's not everything that's at the bookstore by any means, uh, but our particular publications are outlined in this catalog. Feel free to grab you a copy back there so you can kind of see the, especially the curriculum uh, that are designed to be, you know, topical studies or through the Bible studies. It helps to see them in a list a lot of times to really get the sense of that. So be sure you pick up a copy of that. And then one more reminder about at the bookstore today, uh, Suzanne's Bakery is there, and you can enter a drawing uh, at the bookstore. If you show them your lecture attendee uh, for our drawing tonight for a $250 gift certificate. So if you haven't been to the bookstore as a lecture attendee, be sure you go over there and at least enter uh, for that drawing that we'll have tonight. Uh, we'll take a break now and reconvene men in here at 11 and women in the lunchroom.
I will. If we could go ahead and be seated, that will keep us on schedule. When we scheduled the 11 o'clock hour as it is this year, we were sort of taking a chance because we didn't know exactly how people were going to respond to a 45-minute lecture followed by the potential of, well, followed by another 45 minutes of discussion on the subject that we just looked at. It's been, a, the reception of that has been remarkable. And so there, I heard someone say yesterday, uh, I stayed the entire time and I wanted to stay another 30 minutes longer. You know, so the, the ability to interact and to talk about these important spiritual issues uh, is, is really proving itself. And so we have a, a third opportunity for that today. The women are doing the same thing in their session. And so Rachel Reeves is leading the discussion back there this morning. And yesterday we had a challenge regarding Kate Mitchell's lecture. She and Tom were, they always come. They're, Tom is one of the board members, but they were diagnosed with COVID and just, just before they uh, started their trip and decided for safety's sake to stay home. She was able to do it remotely and the connection, once we got it set up, worked and so they were able to interact and she took questions and or they, they offered questions, she gave answers and, and they had a good session. Uh, so it's worked out quite well and we're encouraged by that. And so this hour, in the last of these three interactive sessions in which Kevin Harrington will be discussing overcoming my doubts. Uh, we're fortunate to have him with us. And Kevin has uh, written a very popular book that we publish here at Truth Publications, Finding My Faith. It meets a need that I think is real where it, it honestly addresses that struggle, those questions that people can arise, young people, but not merely young. All of us can struggle with doubt, even as was pointed out uh, by the apostles just before Jesus returned to heaven. Uh, so, Brother Harrington, graduated from FC in 2010, has since then preached in Indiana, Nevada, Georgia, and is currently uh, in the Athens area, laboring with the Marion Street Congregation. They're in the midst of a gospel meeting this week, and so he's taking time off from those activities to be with us this morning, and was here yesterday to participate in the open forum in the afternoon. Uh, but he and his wife, Brooke, they have four children, Landon, Eli, Wilson, and Hadley. And so we're glad to have him with us, and we appreciate the relationship that we have with him uh, in, in this organization, and now look forward to hearing him both lecture and then field questions as we interact after he is finished. Kevin. Well, good afternoon. He said that I was taking a break from the gospel meeting duties. I'm really taking a break from those four children who are at home. So uh, getting to speak to adults uh, is, is a nice change. Uh, but no, I'm blessed to be here. I'm, I'm excited. I, grew up reading several of your books and, uh, and, and feel like learning from, from many of you who have been here for, for many years and now they've asked me to speak and in some ways I feel inadequate to, to speak to a, a room like this where um, there are men who uh, have demonstrated their faith far longer than I have and um, that I've learned from but I'm just I'm thankful for the opportunity. I worked with Marty Pickup for a year while in college, and he taught me one very valuable lesson. He said, Kevin, there's a lot of good things you can say. He said, but when you speak, you speak to the seven-year-old, and maybe the 70-year-old will understand too. And when I thought about what this hour meant for really the entire week, but uh, especially what the topic that I was given, overcoming my doubts, it's titled Practical Apologetics. Uh, what can I use in my life and what can I take out of this room to use daily? And then I got to thinking more about the topic given, overcoming my doubts. It's very personal to me. And I'll share with you some of the things that I went through as a young Christian and, and maybe some of you are, are dealing with and, and I'm still dealing with to a certain extent on how we can overcome some of these things. But first I want to draw your attention to a, a gentleman who sat in his cold, dark prison cell, and he began contemplating all the, the choices that he had made that had led him to his current surroundings. 
He started asking questions like, had he associated himself with the wrong kinds of people? And had he taken his convictions too far? He had devoted his entire adult life, at least, to, to a certain cause that had led him to sitting in prison and eventually his death. He was beginning to doubt what he believed in and, and more importantly, who he believed in. Was Jesus really the Son of God? Was he really the Messiah that had been waited on for generations? Or was all this just a, a scam? False claims by a man claiming to be somebody greater than who he really was. You would probably be shocked to find out that that man who I'm talking about is none other than the cousin of our Savior, John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 11 and in verse 3, really in verse 2, it says, When John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? That question was always interesting to me. Because here's John the Baptist, the, the same John whose birth was announced by angels and spent his life teaching about the coming Messiah, the same John who baptized Jesus and saw the, the, the Spirit descend upon heaven and hearing the God say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, that same John had to send disciples to, to Jesus saying, are you the chosen one? Are you the one we're waiting for? Or are we looking for somebody else? And I always found that question to be interesting because... They weren't looking for Jesus. Now, this is, remember, before Facebook and social media. I understand they didn't have a picture of Jesus. And they weren't saying, are you Jesus? We're looking for Jesus. Are you him? No, they're saying, are you the chosen one? There's a lot of claims about who you are, Jesus. Are you him? Are you this Messiah? Are you the one we're waiting for? Doubt had set in. When you look at the idea of, of what doubt is, we talked a lot about this yesterday in that open forum. Uh, and so those of you who were there, you probably have permission to stand up now and leave. You've heard some of these things already. But uh, the idea of doubt is defined as to be uncertain about something or to believe that something may not be true or unlikely. That's kind of the common definition to, to doubt that, that we give. I, I doubt that Bigfoot is real. It's uncertain. There are photographs, right? But I, I still doubt it. People are trying to find evidence, but yet he's elusive. I, it's, it seems unlikely. There's video evidence of UFOs, and people say that they've seen them and been abducted, but it's, to me it's unlikely. I doubt it. And I'm sure John was sitting there starting to see the unlikeliness of Jesus being the one to mount an attack on the Roman government, to take over Jerusalem, and to reestablish the throne of David. But I believe John's doubts were even deeper than that, because there's a second definition of doubt, and that is to have no confidence in someone or something. You know, he seems so sure of who Jesus was and preparing the way for Jesus, but now that the ministry had begun, and he starts seeing that this is not going the way that we thought it would go. Are you really the chosen one, or are we looking for another? That's just one example of the kinds of doubts that God and Jesus have had to take on over the years. I don't think it's any secret that God and Jesus and the Bible have seen their fair share of doubts. People will question their existence. They question their, their capabilities, their power, their goodness, like we talked about yesterday in this hour, their, their creation, even their salvation. Jesus' teachings, his miracles, and even his resurrection, they've faced plenty of scrutiny. And those who have these kinds of doubts are typically labeled in the negative. We typically, when people start doubting, we typically say, well, they're just weak. They're weak in their faith. In fact, isn't that what Jesus said to Peter, as we'll look at in just a minute? Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? We say that those who doubt, they, haven't, they just haven't been taught properly. They don't know. They don't understand. Or maybe they were taught, they just didn't pay good enough attention the people who doubt, they're worldly, they're sinful, they're selfish, and the list can go on and on of all these things that when we see someone doubting, 
we just automatically label them in the negative. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is look to Thomas, an apostle of the Lord who, when Jesus came back and as he appeared to the apostles in that upper room and Thomas wasn't there, he, I can only imagine what he was thinking. No, he was not there. Hey, you know, unless I can touch him, unless I can feel him, then I will not believe, he says. And because of that one moment, he's no longer Thomas, he's what? Doubting Thomas. See, we forget what happened several days later in that same upper room when Jesus appears to Thomas. And when Jesus says, look, here are the holes, here's my side, stick your hand, touch please, and believe. Thomas has this great, I would suggest, equal to Peter's confession of faith. He has this great statement, my Lord and my God. But see, we don't remember that part of doubting Thomas' story. We just remember he doubted. Would it surprise you to know that there are current disciples of Jesus with their questions and with their doubts? There may be people in your local congregation, maybe even your families, who are wrestling with certain questions and certain fears. They may be dealing with sickness or the loss of a family member because of a sickness, wondering why God would allow such pain and such suffering. Your congregation's young people, and maybe even your own children, are struggling with the ability to serve God and still be accepted by the world and their peers. Maybe even you yourself are sitting here with your own questions and your own doubts. And we assume that Christians should have all the answers. Almost like when you get buried in the waters of baptism, something happens under the water and shoots you full of all the answers, and now you've got it. And when we don't have the answers, we question effectiveness as a disciple of Christ and their status in the local congregations. And we have come to associate doubt with inadequacy and weakness. And what maybe we'll talk a little bit more about in the the question and answer period is I believe what has happened in present day churches is in our local congregations and homes we've created a culture where people are afraid to share what they are struggling with. We are in the middle of a pandemic. And I'm not talking about one that can be helped with masks and booster shots. In my book, Finding My Faith, I illustrate the problems of what's happening among the Lord's people. A LifeWay research uh, study showed that 70% of young people, teenagers really, who grew up in Christian homes and churches will leave the faith when they leave home for the very first time. That number is absolutely staggering to me. That 70%, 7 out of 10 of our young people are going to leave and give up their faith, even though they grew up in congregations that are teaching fundamental principles, they're teaching the Bible, and they're teaching about Jesus. It goes one step further because it's not just a young person problem. Another study that was done by 21st Century Christian, U.S. congregations of Churches of Christ have decreased 12% since the year 2000. To take it one step further, in another local, uh, or I'm sorry, in another recent research, this one done by by Pew Research, it found that 80% of Americans believe in God. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, hey, that sounds wonderful, 80%. Uh, that's down from the, the mid-90s, from just about 10 to 15 years ago. And of that 80%, only 56% believe in the God of the Bible. In other words, the rest are saying, I believe that there is something, maybe it's God, it's a higher power, But the God of the Bible, the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God of the Bible, then I'm not so sure. And this, I I found just this last week, my father-in-law posted it, who preaches out in California. In a new Gallup poll, it is found that only 20% of American adults believe the Bible is the inspired, literal word of God. Those numbers are staggering to me. Christians all over the country are tired and confused. 
They are doubting and they are struggling with what to believe and how to live. And we have a choice, I believe. We can continue to make people feel guilty for having questions and needing answers, or we can start creating a culture that encourages people to ask questions, seek Bible answers, and leave feeling encouraged to keep growing. I told you at the beginning that the title to me was very personal, Overcoming My Doubts. I grew up in a congregation in Brea, California, And we rarely miss services as a family. In in fact, growing up playing sports, the number one rule in our house was if it falls on a Wednesday night Bible study or a Sunday morning, Sunday night worship service, we were going to miss the game. We were going to miss the practice. And I excelled in Bible classes. Christine Kirchville, some of you know who that is. Barry was with us for a gospel meeting here this last week. And uh, it's Barry's mother. Barry and I grew up in the same congregation and. His mother was one of my Bible class teachers, and she always told me and told my parents growing up, she said, that boy will be a preacher one day. I got all my gold stars on the chart for knowing my memory verse and for being there for, for every class, at least the ones that, that, that we had the opportunity to make. And I felt that growing up, I had a strong understanding of the Bible facts and the Bible stories. I knew about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I knew about Joseph. I knew about Jesus and Peter. I knew about Ruth and Rahab. I could quote to you the memory verses. And it wasn't until my, I call it the great awakening that I had in college, Florida College, a Christian school, mind you, that I began to see alternate worldviews for the very first time. I was starting to see how other people interpreted scripture. I was away from home for the first time, and so mom and dad didn't have control of me any longer. And I found that there is this interesting change of dynamic in my life to where I would start seeing what I knew was wrong, but I didn't know how to combat it biblically. And in fact, when I did combat things biblically and try to find Bible answers, even that was combated with different arguments that I wasn't prepared for. Things like homosexuality is a sin. And it says in Leviticus, and I would quote Leviticus, and then it would come back, well, Leviticus is the Old Testament. Do you eat pig? Do you eat shellfish? Well, yeah, I do. And for the very first time, I was being hit with the opposition. But wait a minute, didn't I know about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Didn't I know my memory verses? Didn't I have good attendance at Bible class? And I started realizing that there was this transition from those young Bible classes where we teach the cute little fun stories with crafts, and then we get into the middle school, high school classes, and it's no sex, no drugs, no alcohol. And no one ever made a connection of, here's what Abraham has to do with your faith today. Here's what Joseph is trying to teach us today. Here's why living a righteous life, it's more than just no sex, no drugs, no alcohol. It's living a righteous life pleasing to God. Those connections were never made. And so I began questioning. Was I taught the right way? Was I taught the right things? You know what, by the way, now that I think about it, how is God eternal? Why do good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people? Is God even listening to prayers? Is is the Bible really God's accurate word? Can I follow God's word? And then I started thinking, does, does this mean because I'm questioning I'm weak in faith? Am I sinning for questioning? Should I ha- hide my doubts and, my ho- and, and hope that the preacher maybe just preaches a lesson soon so I can get the adequate answers? And then I read, and I don't know why it hit me like it did, but in Matthew chapter 14, I read the story of Peter walking on water. And it made me rethink how I approach Scripture and how I approach finding biblical answers. In Matthew chapter 14, you have John the Baptist beheaded at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus feeding the 5,000 in the middle of the chapter there. 
that the apostles would have witnessed the feeding of the 5,000, this great miracle that Jesus performed. And that night, as they all get onto a boat, Jesus hangs back. And in the middle of the night, you remember, Jesus comes walking out to the boat in the middle of a windstorm. And it says that the apostles were afraid because it's, they said, look, it's a ghost. And so they cried out in fear. And Jesus, in verse 27, says, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Now Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so Jesus says, come. And when Peter had come out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. I want you to get this mental picture in your mind of you're in the middle of this storm and they're already afraid. And if they're not, a, not just the storm, but now they have Jesus or a ghost walking on water and they hear a familiar voice, but we still don't know if it's really him. And he says, it's I, do not be afraid. And Peter says, if it is you, let me come to you. Right there, what a bold statement of faith. But do you still see the doubt? If it is you... Now, I'm not 100% convinced. But if it is you, allow me to come out to you. And Jesus says, come. Now, let's stop there for just a minute. What if it wasn't Jesus? What if it really was a ghost? But yet Peter has enough gumption to stick his feet over the side of the boat in a storm and see if it's really Jesus. What an amazing act that is. And then, listen, Peter had come out of the boat. He walked on water, the text tells us. He did something that none of us have ever done. I remember trying as a little kid to see how fast I could run and how many steps I can get, you know, if I move my feet fast enough on top of the pool. I never walked on water. Peter did. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Peter helps illustrate several points about doubt and how to overcome it. Through his strengths and even through his weaknesses, I learned how to work through my own struggles. I learned how to get questions answered, and more importantly, I learned where to get my questions answered. And I'm not saying that overcoming that your, your doubts will be easy, but I do want to assure you there is a better way than hiding what you're feeling. The following suggestions are meant to be just that, suggestions. Because the truth of the matter is, we looked at this a little bit yesterday in our open forum, we all have different upbringings. We have different backgrounds, different family dynamics. We all have different doubts. We have different reservations. We all seek and process information in different ways. And our doubts can span a vast majority of topics. But I can assure you this, you're not alone. We are all on a spiritual journey that is bound to have its ups and downs, and I hope that my suggestions will just help you start your journey, or to help others that you're in contact with start your journey to find confidence to answer those doubts. And I believe even though we are all different, these suggestions can bring similar outcomes, a stronger faith in our Savior and in our God. I want to share with you just a few things that I did to overcome my doubts and what I learned from this story of Peter walking on water. The first thing I'm going to suggest to you is change your mindset. As stated earlier, we have, I believe, been trained as a society that doubt equals fear and doubt equals weakness. I mean, even Peter was told by Jesus, so you have little faith, why did you doubt? We'll come back to that in just a moment. To many, doubt equals a lack of faith. After all... 
how can we have a strong faith in God but still have so many questions? However, put yourself back in that boat for just a moment. In a boat full of doubters, Peter was the only one willing to cry out to Jesus and say, if it is you, let me come to you. In a boat full of apostles, the closest people to Jesus who had walked and talked with him daily, who just witnessed the feeding of the 5,000, they were all unwilling to speak up, but Peter said, I'll come to you, Lord. He was the only one willing to go out on a limb and cry out to Jesus, if it is you. Maybe he still wasn't sure, but he was the only one brave enough to question and seek an answer. So he got out of the boat and he walked on water. I would argue that the disciples who stayed on the boat with their mouths shut, they were the weak ones. They were satisfied with just living in fear. Peter was the only one with faith strong enough to do something about it. Yes, he struggled. Again, we'll get back to that in just a moment. But his faith led him somewhere no other disciple was willing to go. We mentioned yesterday, O oh, ye of little faith, that Jesus mentioned to Peter after he began to sink. He did not say, O oh, you unbeliever. No, Peter still needed work, as we all do. But questions of, of, of doubt don't have to equal weakness. When we can change our mindset, we see that if, proper, if we properly channel our questions and doubt, we can begin to take giant steps towards building a strong spiritual faith. I believe in order to grow, we have to humble ourselves and admit we need help, and that can be empowering. And if I have doubts, I have a choice. I can stay in the boat and I can live a life of fear, or I can do what Peter did and I can take a step forward and start looking for answers. Which leads me to the next thing. Don't be afraid to step out of the boat. We cannot be afraid to take that step and start seeking answers. If I wanted to overcome any of my doubts, I had to be brave enough to take that step and admit that I needed the help. I couldn't wait for the answers to come to me. I couldn't wait for the preacher to preach a lesson. I couldn't hope and pray that the Bible class would somehow answer whatever it is I was going through. I didn't want to reach rock bottom before seeking help. I had to be willing to step out of my comfort zone and seek guidance. In my book, Finding My Faith, I discuss the importance of asking questions. We've all been taught that certain things are common knowledge, haven't we? I was taught growing up there's no such thing as dumb questions. But we all know then there's that one kid who has to ask the question, and we all say, that was a dumb question, right? We have opportunities in our congregations where people can ask questions, but I have found that they are afraid to in fear of it being a dumb question. Because it's something that should be common knowledge to Christians. Questions like, I had someone ask me one time, I was afraid to ask what Christ was. Was it Jesus' last name? You hear Jesus Christ? What does that even mean? I was afraid growing up to ask the question of what's a denomination. I just knew when someone asked me when I was in middle school and high school, if you go to church, where do you go to church? Well, I, I go to Bray Church of Christ. Oh, what denomination? It's not denominational. Don't ask me what that means. I just knew the answer to give. I know what it means now. Don't sit there and think, oh, well, we'll have to explain it to them later. We have to, I, I believe it's vitally important to ask questions and as churches and individuals make people feel comfortable asking questions. We should encourage others to ask questions about God, their faith, their doubt, and yes, even maybe their congregations. How else are we expected to learn and grow? You look at examples from scriptures, look at what happens at the beginning of Luke chapter 11, where the disciples of Jesus 
While Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. Well, wait a minute. Isn't that like Christian 101 to be able to pray and talk to God? What is prayer? It's talking to God. It's as simple as that. The disciples of Jesus didn't know how. They said, teach us to pray. We want to be better. We want to know more. What about in Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch? As Philip approaches the eunuch, he sees him reading from the scroll there. He says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, well, how could I unless someone guides me? How many of us, if you're reading something in scripture and someone comes, do you understand? Oh, yeah, I get it. Because we're afraid of admitting maybe I don't. Maybe I don't have a proper understanding, but I would never admit that to the preacher. Wouldn't admit it to mom and dad or my spouse or whoever it is. He said, well, how can I unless someone guides me? He was willing to humbly say, I, I don't have a clue. Can you, tell, can you tell me? The rest of the text tells us at that point on, he began teaching Jesus. And then at some point in that conversation, look, there's water. What stops me from being baptized? He went from, how can I unless someone guides me, to having his questions answered and being a saved soul. Or what about a little bit farther along in Acts chapter 10? Or I'm sorry, 19. Where Paul sees these, these men, he says, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, sir, we haven't even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Can you tell us? And so he started teaching. I've seen a problem in modern day churches, and that is we assume that everyone should be on the same level spiritually. We believe everyone should already know the simple matters of faith. And when someone asks a question that we assume is elementary, we label them as weak. But may I be so bold to say that just because someone has doubts or needs questions answered, that doesn't mean weakness. I would suggest that they are one of the few strong enough to step out of the boat and walk towards Jesus. That if their heart is in the right place and they are searching scriptures and they are genuinely seeking answers and knowledge and truth. And I would go as far to say that those who ridicule those who are seeking answers, we're the weak ones who are just sitting in the boat. Jesus, when his disciples said, teach us to pray, he taught them to pray. When that eunuch said, how can I unless someone teaches me? Philip sat down and he taught. We haven't even heard if there is a Holy Spirit. And so Paul teaches them truth. It is up to us to cultivate an environment in our homes and in our congregations where individuals can feel comfortable seeking Bible answers to their doubts and to their questions. And if we don't, then shame on us for not giving those individuals a place to grow. Because if they don't get it from the congregation or from the homes, and especially from the Bible, they will find their answers somewhere else. And it's no wonder to me, then, why 70% of young people will leave the faith. Why more and more people are not believing in God. Why more and more people are giving up. Now, this is where Peter faltered a little bit. He was doing something incredible. He had taken that step. He had the courage. He had the faith to step out of the boat and start walking on water. But then when he saw that the winds and the waves were boisterous, he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. We've just mentioned that it's okay to ask questions and to, to seek answers. Oh, that's going a little, I don't know what just happened there. Let's back up. We just mentioned that it's okay to ask questions and seek answers, but the heart from which those questions come makes all the difference. We talked about this again yesterday in our open forum. That doubting for the sake of proving a point only seeks selfish ambitions, but doubting for the sake of searching for genuine answers seeks truth. And in Peter's moment of weakness, he knew where to search. He reached out and he cried, Lord, save me. In Hebrews chapter 12, we'll come back to Matthew 14 in just a moment. But in Hebrews chapter 12, 
we have this, this great statement right after the Hebrews 11 where you get all these great men and women of faith. And you get all these great, wonderful things that were done because of their faith. But after that, in verse twelve and, or chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame as he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Life is heavy and sin is difficult. The loss of a loved one is burdensome and we have all these, these weights that so easily ensnare us and these things that pull us down. There's so many distractions that can pull us away from Jesus and instead of letting doubt and fear creep in, we need to keep our eyes focused on the only one who can pull us from that storm. And for all of Peter's doubts in those moments where he was walking on water, notice it's when he took his eyes off of Jesus and he put them on the storm that he began to sink. Well, and we would look at that and we would say, well, you should have kept your eyes on Jesus. Stay focused on Jesus. And there's great parallels to be made with that argument. But what I think is even more fascinating is that in the middle of the storms, as he's sinking, yes, he took his eyes off Jesus. He begins to sink. But while he's sinking, he had enough faith and enough sense to look back up and say, Lord, save me. Not everyone does that when they're questioning and doubting. I can only imagine what that scene would have been like. That there's Peter flailing in the water, and as he looks up, there's Jesus still standing. Seeing, I'm sinking. He's not. The only thing that can save me now is right there. Lord, save me. Paul tells New Testament believers that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The only way we are going to make it through our storms and our doubts and our questions is to have a steady diet of God's word focused on finding your answers in Jesus. I mentioned a few moments ago that 20% of Americans believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Quite frankly, we have gotten too far away from our Bibles. We don't read it, we don't study it, we don't follow it, and we don't teach it enough. And it's no wonder why Christians are doubting and leaving the faith. No wonder why churches are disappearing. No wonder the world seems to be winning. We haven't taken the time to point people back towards Jesus. We tell people they're weak when they doubt and asking the wrong types of questions is wrong. So they go and seek answers elsewhere. And nowadays it's easier than ever because if you want an answer, all you have to do is pull out the phone of your pocket and your answers are right there. We should be encouraging the questions, encouraging people to share their doubts so we can point them back to Jesus and how to use the Bible and how to use it properly. Teach them that in the middle of their storms, they can say, Lord, save me, and there is a Savior who is there. What an amazing blessing that is. And then lastly, and we'll open it up for some questions here in just a, a few minutes. Surround yourself with those who have spiritual goals. I believe the final step, this is what hit me when I was going through some of my doubts, the final step in overcoming your doubts is one of the least talked about moments in the story of Peter walking on water. We get through the story, Peter walks on water, Peter sinks in the water, Peter's being pulled out of the water. You get that, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Once they were all back in the boat and everything calmed down, and I just, in my mind, I picture this clear calm after the rough few moments they just witnessed. They went from in the middle of the, the sea being tossed back and forth to there's a ghost. It might not be a ghost. Peter's getting out of the boat. He's a crazy kook. Well, he's walking on water. He's sinking in water. Maybe that is Jesus. And now we're back in the boat all in just a matter of a few moments. And I just imagine this calm.
And the other disciples in the boat were able just to say, truly you are the Son of God. My wife's mother passed away at a, at a young age. Brooke was just a, a junior in, in college, senior at that point. And she wrote in a notebook a lot of questions that she wanted her, her mom to answer, but she knew that she wouldn't have the opportunity because she was dying of cancer. And one of the questions was, who do I talk to if I have questions when I'm raising children? Mom, you're not going to be there. And her mom wrote in that notebook, as she was sick laying in bed in her last several weeks, she would just take time to write in that notebook and, and give these answers to Brooke. And under that question, who do I talk to? Who, where do I get my questions answered? She wrote, find someone who's raising their children well and ask them. And there's been moments Brooke and I have had to do that. We have a two, four, six, and nine-year-old. We have a lot of questions. And we find people that we feel like are doing it well and godly, and we seek answers. We surround ourselves with people who are raising their kids well, because that's what I want my kids to act like and look like. If you want to be spiritually successful... Surround yourself with people who have the same goals you have. Don't get persuaded by the crowds or whatever the current popular opinion is or whatever the latest religious fad or the fancy speakers are saying. We teach our kids that evil company corrupts good morals. I would also suggest to you that the opposite is true, that good company promotes good morals. We need to make our families and our congregations places where people can come and they can find help growing spiritually closer to Jesus. We need to cultivate environments that help doubting individuals and families get their questions answered. We need to surround them with God's love, His mercy, and His grace. Because I don't know how many times we say this, we want to be in heaven and I want to take as many people as we can with us. Well, do we really believe that? That when someone is struggling with doubt, when we don't, tell them, uh, we don't tell them how wrong they are and that they're failing spiritually. They need to be pulled into the boat with God's people. They need to be wrapped up and they need to be loved. And they need to be encouraged to keep seeking answers. We encourage them to keep walking with Jesus. They need answers. They need Jesus. There's a story. I don't know if it's, it's true or, or not. But there was a story of Ed Harrell at one point. Many of you know Ed Harrell and we miss him. I got to have a class with him at Florida College. He taught a special seminar class and only three of us took the class. Uh, which was kind of unfortunate, but better for us. We got more time uh, with him. But someone tells a story of him that here he is in his old age, and he's doing a gospel meeting somewhere, staying with a family who uh, was housing him for the week, and he disappeared. They couldn't find him. And after searching outside, and maybe he went on a walk, after searching the, the house, they found him upstairs in, in whoever's house it was, their little study. And he's got books all over the floor. He said, what are you doing? We've been looking for you. He said, you know, I had a question that I'd never gotten the answer to. And so I thought I'd just come up here and I'd study just a little bit. He had books laid all over the place. And in his hand was a Bible. And I remember hearing that story for the first time, and I'm a, I'm a young college kid thinking, he's got white hair, he should have it all figured out, right? But no, here he was, still seeking answers. Sometimes still not sure, and still trying to find the answer where the answer deserves to be found in God's word. John the Baptist struggled with recognizing who Jesus truly was at that moment. 
he sat in prison and he sent his own followers to make sure Jesus really was the chosen one. Peter walked on water but still sank. Abraham had a son with someone else who wasn't his wife. The list can go on and on of people in Scripture who had their moments. And maybe you're having yours. That's okay. Instead of hiding them, I think it's time to overcome them. It's time to change your mindset and try to do some hard things. It's time to take a step out of the boat and ask your questions. Dive into God's Word. Surround yourself with those people who want you to succeed. If left unchecked, doubts can hold us back, but when handled in a spiritual, healthy, and mature way, doubts can make us grow into a spiritual force that would rival the likes of those spiritual giants that we admire so much. And who knows, maybe one day you will be the spiritual giant helping someone overcome their doubts. I encourage you to keep going, keep studying, keep praying, stay focused on Jesus. We're going to open it up to some questions. Do we just go right into it or? Yes. I'll walk around and offer people the opportunity to ask questions. I wanted to start off by first of all saying thank you, Kevin, for the presentation and the biblical basis on which you made it from those two wonderful texts of John's doubts and Peter's example in this latter one. My question involves the symbolic application of the winds and the waves. That was the, uh, the thing that those towering and, and, and blustering waves and towering, uh, towering waves and blustering wind was what caused him to take his eyes off of Jesus. In your opinion, and maybe in the opinion of others, what are some things today symbolically that do the same for us? What are the towering waves? What, what are the blustering winds that threaten us? Yeah. and those waves and those towering waves are, are coming. Uh, I can't tell you how many people I've seen on a spiritual high. There, there are giants. There are, are pillars of faith. And I've seen toppled over, those giants toppled over because of what life throws I mean, we can, uh, And I'm sure you have some that you, you're thinking of now, but I've seen sickness of a loved one, loss of a loved one. Opinion that maybe we're not supposed to handle on our own. That maybe God is trying to push us in a way to say, come back. Rely on me. Remember me. I'm here. That's that stay focused on Jesus. And so the winds and those waves, I mean, they can be any number of or any number of us. But but those are some of the big ones that constantly. Any comments on that question or any observations anyone would like to add on that point? Kyle, do you have anything to add? Ready. James one and verse five. First, and It's full of doubts, right? Uh, we all have our moments. But yet you...
and you will find knocking, the door shall be open. Do anything we want, or, or you know, uh, within reason, what it look like, but. That when I go to him, especially for things in the context of going through these trials, what do I need to do? Do I have the confidence that God is? Uh, and I believe more that's without doubt. That's to me the context that to me reconciles some of these things. That Jesus says, How many of you, being good fathers, when his son asked for bread, would give him a stone? He says it in that same context of ask, seek, knock. How many of you, if I can get some of the same in your times of trials, give me wisdom. And, and uh, will show me the way. Through his word, we talked about this a little bit yesterday as well. Uh, we have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness, as Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 tells us. Uh, and God's word is there, and God's word will show us the way. Does that help answer that? I guess it was uh, when you were at Parkview uh, down in the Houston area. You did a lesson similar to what he presented this morning as far as talking about the statistics that show our young people are often falling away. And what were some of the points you drew from that data and, and the solutions that you saw as, as viable? Well, it was just based out of Deuteronomy and how the people would say, when, when your children ask, what do these stones mean, that God anticipated that our children are going to ask questions. Right. And so I just went through in the, in the Pentateuch over and over again, God expects that our children are going to ask questions. And so we need to make sure that we're ready to give the answer. And then in all those cases where it says, when your children ask, then, then Moses gives the answer that they're supposed to give. And it was, you know, like, uh, God gave, uh, how God acted in history or what God's word is or God's power, that those are all the things that would point back to that. So uh, we need to encourage our children to ask well, absolutely. those questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so I, I, uh, I've had experience, you know, my, uh, my older brother, he would, he's not here. I can say whatever I want to about him. Uh, but uh, he, he has been very open with people too, that he went through his moments where he was ready to give up. And uh, it's because a lot of the times he was asking questions. He is one of those that if something doesn't make sense, I'm going to make it make sense, and I need to ask questions about it. At the end of the day, his answers were always by preachers and the different people. Um, that's just what we do. That's just what we do. And the more he would ask, they would say, well, that's just what we do. So it's, it's what we've always done. Um, I would suggest to you, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> It's like, like you were just saying, we're in, you should be encouraging children and, and anybody, friends, family, to ask questions. And when it gets down to that base, well, that's, that's not basic. But continually coming back to God and God, like you were just saying, this is what God has done. Look at what God has done. Look at what God's provided. Can, that's keeping the eyes on Jesus. Giving biblical answers. Understanding the Bible, understanding why God has a plan and what it means for you as, as a 10, 20, 30, 40-year-old person in today's life, that God still has a plan. And the more you can draw it back to that, God's plan, God, God in their mind, questions come later, oh yeah, God's got a plan. God knows. God, and it helps just solidify who God is in their minds. Chris Reeves. Comment on, comment on Mark sixteen fourteen, specifically the upbraided part, and he upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them that had seen him after he was risen. My understanding is that Jesus is not going to upbraid 
they're not re secondary evidence. There's there's eyewitness accounts, and then there's secondary for that. So is, the, is there not also a dynamic here about doubt and disbelief that Jesus is expecting us to accept the evidence? There's a lot of dynamics about doubt and unbelief, and we've discussed a number of them, but is not one of the dynamics, we have to have some skin in the game. We have to accept the evidence, and would not Jesus upbraid us possibly today for not accepting the evidence so i wanted you to comment about the upbraided part yeah uh got to meet the road at some point right uh, i mean we talked about this a little bit yesterday as well why are questions being asked uh at the end of the day it gets to the heart and you go back to the story of thomas for just a moment what does jesus say right after he he has this great realization my lord and my god well you believe because why you saw you've got the evidence standing right in front of you. Uh, but what about those who can't see but still have to believe? Yeah, at some point, we have to get to a point in our faith where the rubber the road, and, and am I willing to accept these answers I'm, I'm getting, that, that the evidence is right before us. And I, I believe we can look and see evidence is all around us. If you really believe God's word is, is his word, uh, the inspired word of God, here's the answers. Are you willing to accept what is right uh, before you? And, and at some point, doubt, and it, again, it depends on the heart. We talked about this a lot yesterday, the individual situation, their background, where they're coming from, uh, all those things. Uh, yeah, there are moments where you just have to say, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is doing any good. <laughs> you are not seeking genuine answers. You're trying to win an argument. You're trying to prove a point. And in today's standard, that's more how I see that working out today. because We don't have Jesus right in front of us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Brother Graham has a comment. Faith is a matter in which a person needs to grow. Peter said, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge patience, and so on. So it's a growth. That means that when a person obeys the gospel, he does so out of faith. But it's not the strong faith that he later develops. He has to grow. The Lord gives attention, of course, to a person's opportunities and a person's abilities. And based on each one's personal, personal abilities and opportunities, he judges us as to whether we're growing in faith, whether we're diligent. There in Second Peter chapter 1, diligence, of course, was a requirement. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and so on. He doesn't specify an one pound of faith or two inches of virtue or three kilograms of something else. But he's going to judge us based upon whether or not we've diligently applied ourselves in these growth areas. That's something I believe we need to take into account. Now, that person with doubts who honestly is seeking answers, trying to study the scriptures, seeking out those who can help him. He's growing. If he's not seeking answers, he's not growing. And so we need to commend people like that. We need to encourage them. We don't need to give them the back of the hand or show them the door. We need to encourage them to do what's right. Now, Mark asked me to make some comments about uh, teaching young people who have doubts. I've been here since 1967 at the school. Of course, I've been gone a little bit. I went away and worked on my degree in school administration, so forth. I spent a few years in Huntsville, 
But even while over there, I did some Bible curriculum materials for the school. And uh, I've been here a long time. I've taught a lot of people. I don't know that I have any uh, silver bullets or any magical answers. But it's always occurred to me that young people respond best when they're clearly shown what the Bible teaches. And when they see that being acted out, being lived day to day by people by people who sincerely love God and are seeking to grow themselves. And by doing that, we develop relationships, not only with the young, but also with others. And it's in those relationships that we're able to teach one another, to encourage one another, to warn one another. And those young people because of their trust, their confidence in a teacher or a parent or a neighbor are more willing to ask questions because that relationship has been built. The foundation is there. And that's the kind of relationship out of which young people, as well as others, grow in faith. Yeah, I, I, to comment on that for just a moment, um, so part of what I did when I, uh, when I read the statistic that you saw on the screen earlier, uh, 70% of teenagers are leaving the faith when they leave home for the first time. Um, that was staggering to me. And that's, that's what really jump-started my thinking of the book Finding My Faith uh, because I realized where that was about the time where I started questioning. And, um, and so I, we taught a Bible class at Marion Street here in Athens and that became two more Bible classes of strengthening my faith and finishing my faith, and then it became uh, a book. And what I did in my research was I've been, I've been blessed to work with congregations. I grew up in California. Uh, I, I was preaching in San Jose before I, I moved here to Athens, working here in Athens, um, in Florida, uh, Indiana, Kentucky, where I've done internships. I sent a survey to all these preachers that I knew all over the country, and I said, I want you to give these to your young people. I don't want you to read the questions because I didn't want those guys to start persuading these kids how to answer. I said, I just want you to hold out these papers, say, can you fill these out for me real fast, put them back in the envelope, mail it back to me. I'd, I'd pay for the postage and everything. And I was asking the young people questions all over the country. How do you feel like you're welcomed and accepted at the church that you attend? How do you feel about can you... Can you ask questions? Do you feel heard? But, and all these kinds of questions. And it was amazing. It doesn't matter what state they were from, what upbringing they had. What it, they all felt the same way. And they all felt like this. I don't have many people I can seek answers from in this congregation. The Bible classes are teaching us things we already know. Like no sex, drugs, and alcohol. We need to know how to live better in a sinful world. They were saying, we don't feel accepted here. We're, we're a different group from the rest of the congregation. We're not seen. We're not heard. We're not used. We're people too. We want to get up and try leading songs. We want to get up and say prayers. We want to, do, we want to be active. And we're not given those opportunities. My own personal experience, my older brother and I, we were the two football players in the congregation. We, you know, we, I know it looks like I... I've gained a little bit of weight, then I'll just keep it at a little bit. Uh, but when I was in high school, man, I, I, could, I was lifting two or three times a day. And our joke at, at our home congregation was, we're only good to people when they need chairs moved. And that's about all we were good for. And it just got me thinking that we're cultivating this relationship with our young people, especially with what Mr. Graham was just talking about. We're cultivating this relationship with our young people that you're not important until you're married and start having kids because that's when we can start filling the seats and pews and, and Bible classes. And man, I just, I felt, one, I felt what they were feeling, but two, I feel like we, we can do better by cultivating an environment where they feel welcomed and wanted. So I, I would encourage you, like you said, 
have relationships with those young people. That middle school, high school age, they need people in their lives because I'm not too far off from that. I'm 34, so I can still remember that with a little bit of clarity. Mom and dad were probably the last places I wanted to go to admit that I'm thinking about some things and I, I, I need some answers. But who I went to were those spiritual giants that I saw sitting in the pews or the preacher that had formed a relationship with me and were sitting on his couch one Sunday night. We'd all gotten fast food playing video games. And I said, hey, can I ask you a question? It wasn't in a Bible class. It wasn't in a special study. It was just we were just sitting together. But it's because he took time to form a relationship. I mean, that is fundamental, making them feel like they are part of the group of saints wherever you're meeting, making them feel like they're wanted, they're desired, uh, and they have a purpose besides just moving chairs for potlucks. But I can talk more about that, or there's a book called Finding My Faith you can go grab out there. Thanks, Kevin, for well done this morning and yesterday, too, in the question session. And I'll put a bookstore plug in for your book also. If you don't have it, um, avail yourself of that opportunity. But I love the fact that you focus on Peter, who I, it seems to me is a, in some ways a neglected character uh, in our study and preaching, certainly compared to, the, to Paul's epistles. But, um, and by the way, another bookstore plug, there's a really good lecture in the 2010 lectureship book on Peter. I mean, it's a really good, maybe one of the best ever. You can probably figure out who wrote it, but we, uh, we, we sometimes need to devote more time. And the point there is that the, what, everything you said about Peter is true, but the story doesn't end there. I mean, this doubter who overcomes his doubts is the person whose speech is recorded on the day of Pentecost. And right. he reminds the Jerusalem church in Acts 15 that this was not an accident that the Lord, by my mouth, he said, chose that this should happen, and, and that the Gentiles should hear. I mean, he's also the one who goes to Cornelius. So I think it's really important to help young people, or as you say, this is not an age-specific issue, to understand that even though there are doubts, and they may be um, as significant. I mean, Peter's the guy who, you know, his wake-up call every morning for the rest of his life, the cock-crowing, is a reminder that I denied my Lord. Mm -hmm. And yet he's, he's an elder who writes in 1 Peter 5 to his fellow elder. So here, the, I think the message is, yeah, doubts can be overcome and you can be triumphant over doubt. And but even piggybacking off of Kyle's question, I mean, James was a doubter. I mean, they, assuming that the author of the epistle to James is What's the brother the of the Lord, which I, I think is the case, um, Richard Baucom makes a British New Testament scholar makes a really good case that the structure of James is actually kind of channeling the Sermon on the Mount. Ask and you shall receive, seek and so forth. Let him who asks and, you know, so you can, you don't have to agree with that, but you have there another example of someone who becomes active and prominent and useful in the Lord's service who came out of a, in some ways, a doubting background. Right. Uh, and uh, I, I don't want to dominate it, but I, I can't let the opportunity pass to throw in a restoration history story. I, I loved your, the question on the point of there's no insignificant questions, no dumb questions when the person asked, was Christ the last name of, of Jesus? Um, there's a story in Mark Twain's autobiography, so if it's not true, at least it's true he said it. Um, so Christ, of course, is not his last name, but do you know what his middle initial was? And Twain, what Twain records is when he was a young printer's devil at Hannibal, Missouri, um, which uh, Alexander Campbell comes to preach there. And of course, Barton Stone lived his last years there, was buried at Hannibal. Campbell turns in an article for the newspaper that Twain's setting type for, and to save some time and space to get it in, uh, Twain doesn't use the name Jesus Christ, he just puts it J.C. And Campbell comes storming into the office when he got the proof and said, how dare you de desecrate my Lord's name? And so he left it in instructions for Twain to reset it, and Twain did, and every time he reset it, he said it as Jesus H. Christ. So for whatever that's worth, and it may be apropos of nothing, but um, th there are no dumb questions, right. and we need to treat um, someone's doubts with respect. Yeah. 
So two things on that very quickly. You know, you, obviously we've chronicled some of Peter's doubts, and we can be here all day chronicling his moments, <laughs> you know. Paul is another one. Killing Christians. He doubted the Lord. Absolutely. Uh, it became one of the greatest Christ. Um, you mentioned, you know, there is no age limit on, on some of these things. You're absolutely right. So uh, I just, I concluded a couple months ago now, actually, uh, a meeting in Tustin, California. And a lady came up to me one night, and I hadn't been able to meet her yet, but uh, she came up to me and she says, you know, I, I have to go back to Idaho today. I said, Idaho, what are you doing in, from Idaho? You know, I thought you were a member here. I just hadn't been able to get to her. She said, I drove down specifically for this. She said, the concepts, now I, I want to be clear, it was not my book, although that would be a great plug for truth to use, this book saves lives. No, uh, she said, the concepts in your book saved my life. She said, I, I had gotten so far away from God's blueprint and his standard of what his word actually is that when I was handed a copy of your book, and I first half of the book is understanding scripture. You cannot understand faith if you don't understand scripture. So you get into scripture and understand all the questions that come along with that, and then you start using life. She said, that I didn't she said, back in that. Just made her... It, her back into God's world. And she drove down to, from Idaho just to listen on this concept of finding my faith. And I'm in my 74 years because I'm finding it for the first time. Finding it from God's word and making my own decisions. Uh, and, and we need to listen. We got a all all over ages. For not just the, I teach the middle school, high school class at least once a year uh, at our congregation, and I give them moments at the end of every class. Ask whatever question you want. I said it stays in this room, uh, unless we got some major issues, we'll go to talk to somebody. But it stays in this room, and we're going to give you Bible answers. I said I want you to ask whatever. This is your safe place to answer these questions. But before class, I visit every single classroom we have downstairs at our church building. Uh, and I sit and I talk with the little kids. I sit at their table. I poke fun at them, and, and we're just we're goofing off because I want them at some point when they hit that middle school age to not say, well, who's this guy? He's never talked to me. No, they have got a relationship of years of me, you know, playing Bible basketball with them or talking to them about how school is or, I mean, anything. Talk to those kids because I have a nine-year-old who he knows who is taking an interest in him at, at church, and he says, I like them, Dad. I said, yeah, I like them too. They're you know, they're, they're good people, but they're listening, they're watching, and they're, you're forming those relationships, and it goes from early on to 74, finding your faith for the first time. Jeremy has a question or comment. Kevin, first of all, thank you uh, for your work. I have a, a question and then a, a couple of comments to follow up, if I may. Yeah. Your first statistic that you used about 70% of teenagers who grew up in a Christian home coming from LifeWay Research. I'm curious about that statistic. Is that in Christendom, Christianity, broadly where that's coming from? Yes, it okay. is. It is. And do you know of any, and I'm, this is not in any way to minimize the significance of that statistic, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, do you know of any sources that have spoken to that more among us, among New Testament Christians, and uh, that would a percentage that would speak to that? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, and, and some of that is difficult because yes. as autonomous congregations, we don't have a governing board that is looking at these statistics on a regular basis. Right. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. But I, I just will, didn't know if anybody had done any, any research. And maybe knows of something. Yeah, maybe somebody lines. knows of something. But I will say from personal experience, um, it's not too far off from what I've seen in, in what I would consider conservative Bible teaching congregation. Right. I know, and I, I don't remember the source, and so I would just have to say you'd have to look this up. I do know that um, some research has been done among uh, institutional congregations and specifically tying it to the participation of their homes in attendance and whether it's one parent, two parents, etc. 
and I, I don't remember the number, so I'm not even going to speculate, but I would just point to that and, and said that was I also found to be enlightening. But I appreciate what you've done. You, you answered kind of a second part in terms of some of the practical things we can do to cultivate those relationships, and I appreciate that. There's just a couple of verses that came to my mind. Um, and uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 14, um, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be mm -hmm. patient with everyone. Right. And it seems to me that we're good at some parts of that and maybe not so at others. And, um, and then uh, Jude verse 22 have mercy on some who are doubting. And that idea of, of showing mercy and extending patience. Mm -hmm. And I am immensely thankful for those who have been patient with me and uh, who have helped answer my doubts over the years, as I know you are. And I just think those are, are maybe a couple of key texts that might help us along those lines. Absolutely, absolutely. And in regards to, well, um, Kyle's got a question down here while he's walking down with the mic. Um, the mother and father in the home. Uh, just because kids reach an age where they might not want to talk to mom and dad does not give mom and dads to slack on their responsibilities. Uh, in fact, there's studies done, and, and I don't have it in front of me, so I can't quote who, who it was by, but uh, one of our elders has quoted it um, several times. Statistics will show that children uh, will follow the faith of their mothers but do it with the intensity of their fathers. So think about that for a minute. They will follow the faith of their mothers statistically, but with the intensity of their fathers. So dads, we may be going, but are we excited to go? Are we showing our kids why we're here, excited to be here? We're learning, we're studying, we're singing, we're praising, we're, we're, all those things. They're going to watch dads for the intensity side of things, which is just an interesting point. And it, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, it starts, starts right there in the home. Kyle. Yeah, I found it interesting in the text that Chris brought up a minute ago in Mark 16 that there he actually, unlike the example you mentioned with Peter, uh, he doesn't describe that as unbelief. He describes it as small belief. But there in Mark 16, he rebukes them for their unbelief in not believing. And I wonder if that doesn't indicate to us that there is an issue sometimes of failing to resolve doubts. Um, do you have any comments on the importance or the danger of failing to resolve doubts? Yes. So a quick comment, too, in, in thinking about these, um, you know, this instance in, in Mark 16. Doubt before the cross was one thing. Doubt after the cross was also completely different because... Now I've told you, I've taught you, I was, we were with you, I was with you for how many, you watched me die, you watched me buried, and now here I am, and you're still? Like, what more do you need, almost? You know, so uh, the doubts, if they were still there, I'm sure that's why the, the chastising kicked up a notch at that point. Uh, but unresolved doubt, um, I mean, we can talk about practical, you know, and, and real life stories of what happens with unresolved Extreme wound, where it just it, it sits there in your mind, and maybe you, you oh, okay, I'm I got a satisfactory, but maybe didn't quite answer it completely, and we'll just shove it back there for later. Well, the longer it sits back there and just sit, uh, it could get worse and worse. I mean, I've seen uh, I've seen marriages hit rocky times and even end in some points because one side wife had doubts early on and we resolved those before we were married but were they because they came up later and it's now well now we're questioning everything right uh and so the the danger of unresolved doubt it sits there and you i almost feel like you can't be your true self because you're sitting there having to hide yeah sure i know what that like my example of denomination i didn't want to admit i didn't know what that was so I sit there, yeah, I'm non-denominational. And they're like, oh, great. I'm like, yeah, it is great. Me, I don't know. And then it just goes longer and longer. You know it. You're kind of, you might be, depending on what your doubts are, you're just kind of spiraled into a ball of lies or, you know, half-truths. And it's just, and then you finally learn, oh, man, I had some teaching opportunities. I didn't even know it. 
And so I would suggest whatever doubts you have, resolve them, get adequate answers, and don't be satisfied until you, they are answered biblically. Uh, and, and that way, nothing, no problems come up, come up later. Yeah. I, I want to uh, make a comment about the statistics you were making, but mm -hmm. first of all, I want to say I agree with you. We want to make it possible for people to feel comfortable to ask their questions, and anything that we've done to shut that down is not uh, good for the situation. Ken Ham, who did the Creation Museum and the, the ark that is on the south side of Cincinnati. Um, he did two books. I can't remember the one of the name of both of them, but one of them was already gone. And what he was recording in that book is we used to think about our young people losing their faith when they went off to college and were on their own, such as you described this morning. But he also said when we come back to the children in fourth through sixth grade, they've already lost their faith in the Bible by that time because of this worldview that is being presented in every form of media that there is. We've got to face the situation of our children losing faith by this different worldview that they are absorbing from the culture around us from the day they're old enough to take any kind of media into their hearts, see it and believe it and think about it. Absolutely, absolutely. I have, um, I have a, a fourth grader, he's going into fourth grade. Um, the questions that he can come home with, the things that he's seen, you know, they get iPad time, that's how they do a lot of their learning when they finish certain things, they get free time on kids' YouTube. Of course, there's blocks and things that they can't get to. But man, it's still there, even on kids' YouTube. And the questions that, that, that we field at home because of that. Now, what I was taught early on, to, to your point, never, ever, and this can go for your own children in your own home or just your congregations, whatever, never say, we'll, we'll answer that later. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Because what that tells them in the back of their mind is a couple things. They, and that may not be true, but it tells them a couple things. You either don't know the answer or you don't want to take the time to answer it for me. So guess what? The next time he asks that question, it might be a friend at school. It might be a teacher. It might be Now, he's third going into fourth grade, so the questions now are, are minimal. But imagine as he grows... You know, I'd never say, I'm, we're not going to answer that right now. I say, you know what, that's a great question. I make them feel, that's a good question. I want to answer that. Can I have some time to think about how I'm going to answer that the right way? You know, you're not dodging the question, you're, but I'm going to put some thought into that. Can we talk about this later tonight? When I have a little bit more time, we can talk about it. Uh, and when you're in a Bible study, don't be afraid to tell people, you know what, I don't know. But don't ever leave it at, I don't know. I'm going to find out the answer. We're going to get back together. My brother works at Best Buy still from high school to now. He, he runs a couple stores up in the Brentwood area, uh, up, in, up in Tennessee. And, uh, you know, ask and I'll try to give an answer. And my brother said, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Called me, I told him some things, he looked up some things in scripture, he had, got an answer. A week later, he saw the guy again. He said, hey, by the way, he goes, I got an answer for you. And the guy looked at him like, you actually found, like, I thought you would just were blowing me off. He says, no, you asked, I want to give you an answer. And uh, nothing ever came of that study. They, they wanted to get together and study more, and he did a little bit, but nothing ever came of it. But at the same time, the guy was blown away that he would even take the time to answer. And our kids need to, to see that, that we will take time with them to make sure they are getting their faith cemented early on. Absolutely. I don't know where we are. I see lots of hands, so I'm going to go to Kyle. Okay. Well, just <laughs> piggybacking off of Jeremy's question about survey data. Now, this is older from the 1990s, but it would be interesting to compare. In other words, this is survey data about Church of Christ young people who are the parents of the kids who are now saying, we don't have anybody to talk to and nobody to listen to, but 
David Lewis, who I was at FC with, now deceased, um, did this survey data. He was teaching at Abilene at the time. And it's uh, published in a book called Shattering the Silence. And then there's another one called The Faith of Generation X. And the main takeaway from it was that what they learned is that there's only marginally statistically, marginal statistical difference between what Church of Christ youth were reporting and what general national surveys report. That while we might like to think that our young people are different, not not the case, at least according to what that was done. Absolutely. And then, I, I didn't finish my Mark Twain story, which was to your point. I've often wondered what if instead of storming into this office with an understandable attitude of anger that Campbell had, assuming the story's true, which I can understand. I mean, I might have lit my fuse too for somebody to be that disrespectful. But what if, what if he had taken a different tack and tried to explore with a young Samuel Clemens, why did you do that? What the different outcome of Twain of Clemens's life uh, might have been, rather than skeptical. So yeah. you know, that's speculation, of course. Yeah, as he as he takes the microphone to the next person, you know, is uh, the more you can relate to somebody, you know, that's what Paul did when he taught. I'm I'm there with you. I'm the chief of sinners. I, you know, uh, the more you can relate with somebody and and get on their level and see where they're coming from and saying, can I understand why you are asking this or doing this? I mean, that can go a, a long way. Let me just add, there is a book by an institutional preacher named Flavel Yakely, I believe, called Why They Left, that offers a little bit of information like that, too. Which one for? I'll remember that name, Flavel. Uh, I appreciate the the input about statistics. The other thing, um, you mentioned something about, uh, something was said a while ago about unresolved doubts, and it Mm -hmm. made me think of uh, something you said about you know, that's just the way we do it, or that's just what we do. And the problem with that is not just leaving the unresolved doubt, but that's essentially that's making ourselves the authority, the standard. Oh, absolutely. It's just what we do. So then, what's the difference in so, you know what's the difference in that and somebody else who says, well, this is what I think, or that's what I do, or that's what we do. It, it and so it. It is just, not only is it not uh, resolving the doubt, not only is it not truly providing an answer, but I would suggest that's even sowing additional doubt, additional skepticism, and sowing seeds for even greater departure because the human then becomes the authority. Well, think, think about a kid going to mom and dad asking certain questions, and the answer that they get is that's just what we do. Well, where's that coming from? You know, and that's, to me, that's... Well, now, in that kid's mind, the answer of why we do what we do is because mom and dad said so. So then they go and leave home for the very first time, and they're presented with all these new ideas. Well, mom and dad said this, and it's, no, it's not rooted and grounded in, but God said so. There's a very big difference between God saying so and mom and dad saying so. Those should go together, obviously. But for mom and dad to, to not just say, well, that's just what we do, but to show the why, here's what God has asked us to do and instructed us to do and, and all those things... That's why it's, I mean, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, not the word of mom and dad, right? So going back there and letting that be your source of this is why, it's 10 times more adequate answer than just because. Absolutely. I want to suggest that every Bible class teacher follow the practice of having a Bible question and answer session. I've done that for years in my classes here at the school. I announce that every grading period we'll have a Bible question day. It doesn't have to be related to what we're studying. It can be anything in the Bible. I announce it in advance because I want them to have time to think of their questions and write them so they won't forget them that day. I also do it when I've taught young preachers classes. There's some young preachers in here today who've been in my classes. I always start those classes with what's on your mind. What questions do you have? And then at Rustic Youth Camp, where I've taught Bible for many years, I do the same thing. I teach class in the morning, but then in the afternoon I go and do a Bible question and answer session for high school classes. 
that's immeasurably important, not just because of the information it conveys, but also it helps to cement that relationship that right. I talked about earlier. It right. shows an interest, a real love for people, a desire to help them. And don't be afraid in those, if, if you end up doing some of those question and answer periods, don't be afraid of a couple things. Don't be afraid of the I don't know. Find someone who does and suggest that. We have Steve Mosley at our congregation. Some of you know him. He, he teaches here at ABS and chemistry, biology. And there's sometimes I get questions and I, I don't know. Steve does. Let's go talk to him. Let's go talk to this person because they'll be able to give an answer that's better than me. And again, it just shows that effort. But two, don't be afraid of hard topics either. We shy away from certain topics because they're uncomfortable and not fun to talk about. But we can't shy away from them. And maybe, just maybe, we'll learn something and studying those at the same time as well. But you know, there's a difference between saying that's just the way we do it and saying this is a traditional way of doing what this scripture teaches. So thank you so much Absolutely. for your lecture. Thank you all. And let me commend to everyone. We had hoped to have it ready in time for lectures, but Evan had also put together some uh, sermon notes for kids that will uh, be able to be something that can be used by children or even older older kids uh, or older folks uh, during sermons to encourage them to follow along, encourage them uh, to take notes, and one of these ways to try to help them uh, really make these things their own rather yeah. than just what they've been told. Thank and and you for so the much. kids ones, things for parents to do with kids through the week to just bring it all together. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the good participation in each of these, these three sessions, and Kevin, for the excellent job you've done in this setting and in the book you've presented. Uh, Lance is going to offer a few closing comments for this morning's hour. Remember this evening, of course, the singing and the uh, final lesson by Brother Dan King. As soon as Lance is completed, we're going to ask Brother Paul Douthat to lead us in our closing prayer. I just want to mention a couple of things. We've sold several of Kevin's books this morning, obviously, but there are a few more in the foyer, so if you're interested. Am, am I radioactive? What, what's the deal? Um, there are a few more in the foyer, so grab one while you got a chance. We've got more over at the bookstore. Uh, check that out. I did want to mention, especially because of Mike's comment a while ago about younger um, you know, kids losing their faith early and everything, now, we have several books. I'm just going to point out one here, but this is a, an evidences book with various authors in it. But this, to me, is a really good adult study to then think about how do you talk to your kid about it, you know. And then another one is Unraveling Evolution uh, by Josh Gertler. Looks similar to this in the Truth and Life series. Uh, again, adult study, but to think about, okay, how do I talk to the children about it in that way. So maybe take a look at those uh, as well. Remember, if you want to go over to the bookstore, Suzanne's Bakery is there, and be sure you enter the drawing for the $250 gift certificate tonight. We'll do that uh, in the evening lecture. Let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer. Let's all pray together. Our Father and God in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for the day. We thank you for this time that we've been able to spend uh, opening your word and encouraging each other from it, uh, learning how we can be better people of faith. Father, we believe that you exist. We believe that your son came to this earth and that everything that is written in the scriptures is true. As we sometimes struggle with the our understanding of all of these things. We pray that we might uh, always come to you in prayer, that we might seek the help of those who are also people of faith as we have our struggles together. Father, we're thankful that you've included in your word people who were both pleasing to you but also had their own struggles of faith. Help us to be patient with each other. Help us to learn from their example and help us to ultimately be the kind of people that they were, people who uh, many times even died for their faith and made other sacrifices for their faith. We pray that you would continue to be with us. Please be patient with us. Help us to always be patient with each other, and especially help us to help other Christians to grow uh, both from their initial walk with you or even those that are being raised in godly families. Help us to help them. 
Father, be with us as we uh, come to a close at this time. And may we always remember who we are and please you on everything we do. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
thought of something today, okay. and I just, I, I, I toyed with it, and it's like, I'm not going to do it, and then I pushed the mic. Um, <laughs> on my song, uh, God is Love, uh -huh. the first one, can I just do the chorus after the last verse for that one? Yeah. Or is that something that can't be changed? No, I, I think we can change it. <laughs> Let me get it, I'll, I'll get it pulled up when I get my cameras set up here. No, you're good. And, uh. Yeah, uh, should be. Let me just make sure I don't run into any issues. Okay. Hey, what do you think about who's leading uh, the Salter song first? Uh, Greg. Who's going first? Okay. And then I'm leading mine, and then he's going to lead his chorus, and then I'll lead my chorus. Okay. Uh, okay. How are you? Are you leading the chorus tonight? Yes, I'm one of them. Going to try. <laughs> no, I was just doing a song. Uh, oh, for music, would that just shake notes? Or That's or what I was about to throw at him. <laughs> Sorry which, about one, that. which one are you doing? <laughs> one, 118. Yeah. To what tune? Um, hold on. Um, the stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Oh, this one. I was going to try to talk one of y'all, at least one of y'all, into let's try it without a tune. I can do that first. Can you do the one we're doing? I'm the one that has the tune. I don't know what his tune is. He, okay. he did 110. Okay. So <laughs> it just is so sweet. We'll just see what his thoughts are if he has a preference one way or the other, and we'll roll with that. But I'd like to at least, since we've done it now for two nights, and everybody's kind of gotten a sense of it, I think tonight would be a good night now to try it without the shake notes, um, and uh, you know, see how it goes or whatever, and, and if we'll still keep them on the screen or in, yeah. the, in the presentation that way, if we see it's a real struggle, then I'll kind of leave it up to the song leader to say, all right, now we'll pull it up with shake notes. And it again or whatever. Okay. I know you wanted to hear experience, so yeah. Uh, can you give me a particular album to do? No. Just uh, the main thing was in case y'all came up with something that oh this needs to be changed. We got time to actually. All right. Yeah. Okay. Got it. I'm gonna go find the line. Okay.